Coming in at number 5, Silver Bow in Bed and Breakfast. The Silver Bow Bed and Breakfast is located in Juneau, which is the capital city of Alaska. The inn is more famously known for its bakery that was founded in 1898 by the original owner Gus Messerschmidt. This is the oldest bakery in Alaska and some say it is the best. Although people travel from far to taste the treats in the bakers, there are reports of paranormal activity in the inn above. The original owner and founder of the inn reportedly still haunts the premises. The story goes that the owner loved his bakery and inn. He spent his whole life dedicated to creating the finest bakery. From the day it was built, he spent all of his time here. He loved welcoming the customers and ensuring everyone enjoyed their stay. Inevitably, having spent all of his time at the inn, he was here when he passed away in 1938. He was so dedicated in life, it seems his soul was tethered to the place in death. Since he passed away, guests of the bakery and inn have reported a lot of paranormal activity. The most commonly reported sighting is of Gus opening his shop early in the morning. People have seen a figure matching his description walking around the halls as he once did to prepare for his day. This is not the only thing that guests have noticed. Some people have reported knocking on their bathroom door. When they go to investigate who it is, there is no one there, but they have a feeling of being watched. Many believe this is Gus checking up on the guests. He also wanted to ensure everyone staying there was happy and people believe this is a sign that he's still checking in on the guests today. Coming in at number 4, the Hotel Captain Cook. The Hotel Captain Cook, located in Anchorage, is notorious for its paranormal spirit which has been nicknamed the White Lady. People often take ghost tours of the hotel, hopeful of a chance to meet this famous spirit. Although the origins of the ghost are mostly unknown, from her behaviour it appears she passed away in the women's bathroom, or at least in the area which may have been home to something else before the hotel was built. The locals explain how she is bound to this place and is unable to pass on. She could possibly be cursed as she seems distressed about her situation. Since the hotel opened there was a lot of paranormal behaviour in the area. She would break the glass of the mirrors in the ladies bathroom or swing open the doors to scare those inside. The hotel management had to step in when one guest used the bathroom stall located at the very end of the ladies room. While in the stall she felt something fall around her neck and start to get tighter and tighter. The woman panicked and ran from the stall. As soon as she left the cubicle the sensation stopped. Since then, the bathroom has been bolted shut as to stop this from happening to anyone else. She does seem to be mostly contained to this stall, but there are still paranormal happenings. Lights turn on and off on their own. No one has been hurt since the spirit was locked away, but I would still stay far away from this hotel. Unless you're looking for an angry spirit, this is a hotel that should not be on your list of destinations to visit. Although, my parents were there and it's fine. You know, they're gooch. They're gooch gang. In at number 3 we have the Allen House. The Allen House was built back in 1905 and was named after the original owner, Joe Lee Allen, where he lived in the home with his family for many years. Although Joe died in 1917, his wife Caddy stayed in the home with the three children Laddle, Lonnie, Lee and Lewis. Sadly, Laddle took his own life in one of the bedrooms by drinking potassium cyanide and it was unknown for many years for why she did it. After her death, her mother Caddy Allen kept the room completely closed off from the rest of the house. When Caddy passed in 1954, the property was split into rental apartments and soon after renters moved in, they reported hearing footsteps and moans from the bedroom where Laddle died. In 1985, new owners bought the house and opened the bedroom and it still contained the bottle of cyanide in a closet. The house changed owners twice and in 2007, Mark and Rebecca Spencer purchased the Allen house and had a complete paranormal investigation done in 2008 because of the endless unexplainable instances. The investigators recorded over 40 voice phenomena and had their own paranormal experiences throughout their investigation. On August 22nd, 2009, Laddle's love letters were discovered in the attic floor. Over 90 letters detail her 1948 love affair which ended with her taking her own life on Christmas night. After the owner Mark had experienced endless amounts of paranormal activity and discovering Laddle's love letters, he wrote a book called A Haunted Love Story. Now Nowadays the home can be booked for tours explaining the history and the paranormal activity that goes on in the Allen house. During the Halloween season it's open to the public from 6 to 11pm for tours and paranormal investigators and ghost lovers flock to hopefully experience Laddle's ghost that haunts the house to this day. In at number 2 we have Clayton House. The Clayton House is a historical treasure but it's also one of the most haunted places in Arkansas. The home was originally built in 1852 by a man known as Mr Sutton and several years later William Henry Harrison Clayton purchased 
purchased the house and renovated it, doubling it in size, transforming the style into Victorian Gothic Italianate. Mr. Clayton lived here from 1882 to 1897 with his wife along with their seven children. The home still has old portraits of William and his wife Florence hanging on the wall and still had numerous priceless family belongings in the home. William had a twin brother, John K. Clayton, who was a US senator who had been mysteriously assassinated in 1873, and many believe his ghost is one that haunts the Clayton house. The second floor bedroom seems to have the most activity, and staff and visitors have reported hearing footsteps, boots stomping, and doors slamming, along with seeing apparitions. Music and singing have also been heard throughout the house. People who have visited this home have described seeing one ghostly apparition known as the Tall Man, who is dressed in all black, wears a hat, and walks angrily around. Another spirit often seen around the Clayton property is described as the woman in the brown dress. The woman is said to be peaceful and often just stands in one spot quite still. She is believed to be either Mrs. Clayton or possibly a nurse from the time the property was a hospital. The home became abandoned during the Civil War before it transformed into a Union Army hospital. There was a carpenter in 2007 who was doing some repairs on the home and took pictures before it started working and when the pictures were developed, there was what appeared to be a woman in one of them. The home is now listed on the National Registry of Historic Places and holds tours of the home explaining the history and ghost stories. And finally and at number one we have Crescent Hotel. The Crescent Hotel was built in 1886 and can be found in Eureka Springs. Due to the rich history, it has hundreds of tales of paranormal experiences and ghost sightings. The hotel has previously served as both a private girls college and a cancer hospital where Dr. Norman Baker claimed to have the cure for cancer. There are so many stories of ghost sightings, starting in room 218 where Michael, an Irish stonemason, who fell to his death when building the hotel. He's known to hang out in this room and is often seen. Theodora, a cancer patient who is known to be seen fumbling for her keys outside room 419 as well as tidying up for guests when they leave the room. Brecky, who passed away in the hotel, has been seen throughout the hotel, often bouncing a ball. Dr. John Fremont Ellis, the hotel's former in-house doctor in the 19th century, is often seen or his cherry pipe tobacco is smelled near his former office, which is now room 212. Even the famed hotel cat Morris, who had been buried on the hotel property, is regularly seen and heard. A reoccurring phenomenon happens at a specific spot on the third floor, where the hotel connects to an annex built onto the hotel when it was a hospital. The area has been said to be a portal to the other side. There have been multiple guests who have grown faint, with a few passing out frequently. Guests turning pale and falling against the wall and then sliding down, many paranormal investigators believe that limestone has a special ability to absorb and release electromagnetic and psychic energies. Crescent Mount in the hilltop the hotel sits on is predominantly limestone. The massive thick stones used for the body of the hotel were also made of limestone, and these factors may contribute to the amount of paranormal activity the hotel guests experience. The Crescent Hotel is dubbed America's most haunted hotel and has been on many TV shows like Ghost Hunters, Ghost Adventures, and Paranormal Witness. There have been an abundance of extraordinary experiences and have attracted the attention of paranormal investigators to study and research the hotel's supernatural activity. The hotel offers daily ghost tours to learn more about the ghost stories, sightings, and the history of the hotel. Number five on this list is the Molly Brown House. If you live in Denver, then there is no way that you aren't familiar with this haunted place. Thrillist says you've no doubt heard of the Molly Brown house and likely passed it on the street once or twice too. Molly Brown was a notable member of Denver's elite and perhaps known best for being a titanic survivor and despite allegedly living a relatively happy life, visitors to the museum and staff have reported quite a bit of strange happenings. Some have smelled what's believed to be husband JJ Brown's pipe or have witnessed lights off and on the fritz, and staff have reported furniture being seemingly rearranged. Sometimes figures can even be seen roaming the house. A visit is worth it alone for the history, but the potential for getting a bit spooked or walking into a cold spot is definitely an added bonus. We once again have one of those locations where no one has any idea why it's haunted. It just is. Maybe it's the connection to the Titanic that has got this place acting funky. Obviously, that was a very unnatural occurrence and took the lives of tons of people in a very sad way. So I could believe that the Titanic and the survivor of the Titanic plays some role into why this place is haunted the way that it is. Good news is that this isn't the worst haunting that you can run into. Like yes, you will get a little scared for sure. You might smell something funny or have a ghost pull something on you or even maybe have small valuables go missing. But ultimately, you probably shouldn't be dragged to the underworld here by some shadow demon or anything like that. So I guess if you were to visit, 
at any place on this list, then this one wouldn't be the worst. Just be prepared for what's coming, because if you aren't, then it could leave you with some serious mental trauma. Number four on this list is Phantom Canyon Road. You need to be very careful on this road, because there is a good chance you could suffer a serious crash if you aren't. Thrillist says a haunted road is one thing, but a haunted road in Colorado means you're likely on the edge of a mountain and at some serious elevation. Phantom Canyon Road is a detour off the Gold Belt Tour byway connecting Cripple Creek and Florence and was originally the railroad for that route. As you drive along, you can clearly see the ghost towns of Wilbur, Adelaide, and Glenbrook, and legend has it that the reason for Phantom Canyon's name is credited to sightings of a man wearing a prison uniform walking along the tracks in the 1890s. The man supposedly had been executed at the Colorado State Penitentiary a few days earlier. So yeah guys, you better have your wits about you, cause if you don't, this ghost might come out and startle the crap out of you, and then the next thing you know, you're gonna be face deep into a tree somewhere. It also just adds to the horror ambiance that you're driving past several ghost towns along the way. Like of course, they just had to be on the side of the road as you're also getting stalked by this ghost prisoner. No one really knows what this prisoner wants with you, but let's face it, I can't imagine it's good. My dude was executed back in the day, so for one, what he did was probably pretty bad to warrant a punishment like that, and then secondly, he literally got executed and I can only guess that his ghost probably isn't too pleased about that. Y'all need to be especially careful if you're driving down this road, cause at any point this guy could pop out. In at number three we have Avon Bridge. The Avon Bridge is known to be haunted by almost every local living in the area. It is a massive trip art railroad trestle spinning a rural road over White Lick Creek. The bridge is a fascinating landmark in Hendricks County with lots of legends and history surrounding it, some more sinister than others. There are a few historical facts about the bridge that we do know. It was built in 1906 off County Road 625, it was designed by W.M. Dunn and is still used today. Many haunted stories surround this bridge and the area surrounding it. One story claims that a mother had been walking on the tracks and fell to her death. The mother's wailing could be heard when you drive under the bridge. It's common for many locals to honk when driving under the bridge in an effort to muffle her screams. Another story is that a drunk rail worker slipped during construction and was buried alive in the wet cement. The tale is that when a train goes over the bridge, people claim to still hear his moaning. Many locals say that if you go near the bridge at night, you will hear moaning and can see a ghostly figure of a ghost or even two or three at a time. If you're traveling near the bridge on a hot summer day, you may be witness to the ghost tears streaming down the concrete. Many people don't even refer to it as the Avon Bridge, it's often called the Haunted Avon Bridge because of the number of accounts of ghost sightings and constant sounds of the moans and screams heard from the ghosts that haunt the bridge. In at number 2 we have James Allison Mansion. The James Allison Mansion was built for James Allison and it was a dream home, done in a grand design and style that exhibited James's wealth and importance. James was an important figure in the auto and plane industry, greatly helping in the development of cars and airplanes. He founded the Presto Light Company, which produced the first efficient headlight for early automobiles and was a founding partner in Carl Fisher's Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He also started Allison Engineering Company, which evolved and transformed into an aircraft engine make, known today as the Allison Division of Rolls Royce. James purchased the 65 acre estate and he and his wife Sarah built this glorious mansion, starting construction in 1911 and finishing in 1913. The massive home had an elevator, a billiard room, an indoor pool in the basement, a breakfast room, a library, a grand kitchen and even pumped in ice water. 15 years after the Allisons built their forever home, James then fell in love with his secretary and he divorced his wife Sarah in 1928. Only a month later James married this former employee Lucille Musset. However, James contracted a fatal case of pneumonia and died shortly after marrying his second wife at the age of 56. In 1936, the estate went up for sale and that same year it was bought by Sisters of St. Francis of Oldenburg. The former Allison home became a home for the college's library, administrative offices, classrooms and sleeping quarters for the sisters. There have been many things seen and heard throughout the years since it became a college. There was a girl who had drowned in the pool in the basement and James
James' untimely death in the home, both people could be haunting this mansion to this day. It said that people who pass through a sudden accident or a bout of illness, sometimes their spirits hang around, perhaps unaware that they have died or not wanting to accept their deaths. And this is the case for both the little girl and James. The entity of a little girl is often seen throughout the mansion. There are strange cries that are heard from the basement. In the attic, an object seem to move by themselves and can completely disappear. There is another entity seen and could possibly be more than one, and they like to take keys and objects and move them to odd places. The library in particular is often completely rearranged, like the books and furniture. And finally, in at number one, we have French Lick Springs Hotel. Nestled in the small resort town of French Lick sits the massive French Lick Springs Hotel. This legendary hotel was constructed in 1845 and is a crown jewel of the southern Indiana town. But there's more to this resort than meets the eye. This Indiana hotel is known to be one of the most haunted places in the state. Thomas Taggart was a mayor at the time and purchased the hotel in 1888. After purchasing the hotel, he added luxurious furnishings, marble floors, and built two championship golf courses. During this time, Taggart became the Democratic National Chairman, and the hotel became the unofficial headquarters of the Democratic National Party. In 1931, Franklin Roosevelt visited the hotel because of its Democratic standing and won the presidency a mere year later. Over the years, the hotel and the work Taggart put into it made it one of the most prominent hotels in the area and even ran the West Baden Springs Hotel out of the business. Unfortunately, in 1916, Taggart passed away, but according to local legend, his spirit has never left the building. Taggart died in 1916, but that hasn't stopped rumors of sightings of this famous hotel owner. Guests and employees frequently encounter strange and paranormal activity throughout the hotel, and they believe it is caused by Taggart himself. Many spot his ghostly figure near the service elevator and can pick up a strong scent of pipe tobacco. Others claim they witnessed his spirit riding down the hallway on a horse and making noise inside the ballroom. Some hear noises and others encounter his ghost, though usually both don't occur at the same time. Not only is Taggart's ghost living in the hotel, but there are also rumors of a former bellhop that lingers around the hotel. Many believe that he was a current employee until they saw old photos of him hanging on the wall or were told no bellhops were on duty when people had encountered him. Employees and guests say that it's pretty hard not to encounter some sort of activity when you're in the hotel, and due to the vast amount of paranormal sightings are why it's considered by many to be the most haunted place in Indiana and one of the most haunted places in all of the United States. In at number 5 we have Eldridge Hotel. The Eldridge Hotel is a historic building located in downtown Lawrence, Kansas. The building is named after Shayla Eldridge, who was a prominent anti-slavery individual who lived here in the 1800s. The building became an apartment complex in the 1970s, but there was a strong desire by the city to see it open as a hotel, and a group of investors contributed, as well as the city of Lawrence, into industrial revenue bonds to make this dream a reality. In the later 1980s, it opened as a hotel. A popular story has circulated about the hauntings in this hotel, with the locals, employees, and guess that the ghost is that of Shayla Eldridge, who haunts the halls to this day. Many claim that because the Eldridge House's original cornerstone is located in room 506, and his spirit will manifest in that room and also roam around the building. People who have stayed in this room have claimed to witness breath marks on recently cleaned mirrors, doors opening and shutting on their own, and lights turning on and off by themselves. Others claim that the hotel's elevator is also haunted by a different spirit, who is known to open and shut the elevator doors on the fifth floor. The fifth floor floor is said to contain a portal to the spirit world. A popular photograph was taken during the 1980s that clearly shows a ghost-like figure in the building's elevator. Many other photographers have mentioned having unexplained technical difficulties with their cameras when near the elevator. The story of the hotel and the hauntings of Eldridge was the inspiration for the movie The Demon Shadow, and the hotel was featured in the series My Ghost Story and has been depicted in many writings. Many believe the rich history has resulted in the amount of paranormal activity. In at number 4, Midland Railroad Hotel. The Midland Railroad Hotel is known for serving the largest steak around, and if you can finish all of it, you get it for free. But it has a sinister, haunting history. It was first a popular train stop in the 1890s, then known for being the location for the movie Paper Moon, where many scenes were filmed at this hotel in 1973. Since then, it's gone through fires, the Great Depression, and plenty of renovations. It is now owned by the Wilson Foundation, has been back in business since 2003 and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Not only is this hotel known for these interesting things, it's most known now for the paranormal activity that lurks around the hotel. The most famous ghost is that of an orphan
orphan girl that haunts the third floor who knocks on doors, runs through the hallways and even jumps on your bed, leaving little footprints. A ghost hunting team has experienced this spirit and have recorded sounds of the little girl. Another third floor room is where a sheriff was said to have been lynched and sometimes the door is unable to be unlocked even by the master key. Ghostly figures have been seen at the top of the stairs and things in the kitchen have flown distances suddenly without being touched by anyone. There are also many ghostly figures that are seen on the staircases and have left many to believe that the fire that took many lives back in 1902 are the results of some of these paranormal presences. The owner of the Midland Railroad Hotel, Melinda Merrill, says that there's not one employee who hasn't seen or felt something and you can definitely feel a presence when you enter the hotel. Number three on this list is the Kentucky State Penitentiary. We always got to include the creepy jail on one of these lists guys and this is Kentucky's. Virginia Travel Tips says the Kentucky State Penitentiary is situated near the Tennessee border on a sharp bend in the Cumberland River. In the 1800s a maximum security jail was built there. It is a gorgeous place from afar but up close it is a death and ghost machine according to a local author and paranormal investigator. Thousands of men have been executed in the prison's electric chair known as Old Sparky. During his death row cell inspections in the late 1980s, a guard had a terrible incident where no one stayed. He was greeted by a prisoner who was reading the Bible. When he returned to his office, he asked about the prisoner's meal, only to discover that no one was in that cell. When he returned to the cell, he discovered that it was empty except for a small Bible on the floor. Yeah, kind of weird. More strange occurrences were recorded around the institution, with many reporting seeing a reflection of an inmate who attempted to shock them. Okay, so honestly guys, I want to take this as seriously as possible, but old Sparky? Like imagine dying in a thing called Old Sparky. Like I think it's meant to electrocute people, but why does the killing chair sound so cute? Kinda sounds like something that you name your dog, not a murder weapon. Anyways, Old Sparky has certainly done its job though, and now the place is super haunted. Most of the prisons we talk about on this channel you can go visit if you like, because they're all typically abandoned. That's not the case with this one though. The Kentucky State Penitentiary is still fully operational and has tons of prisoners in it. Not only do these people have to chill in jail, but it just so happens that their jail is also haunted. Number two on this list is Mammoth Cave. So we actually spoke about Mammoth Cave on this channel before in our series about top five terrifying caves where evil awaits. So if that interests you, then go check it out. It made that list because it was super haunted and naturally it has to make this one as well. It is, as you'd expect, located in Kentucky. It is the biggest cave in the state by far, which is why it's named Mammoth Cave. Most of the cave has been unexplored, which is kind of nuts considering we've already seen about 400 miles of it up until this point. This has been an area of interest to people for thousands of years. Back 4,000 years ago, it's believed that people used this cave to bury their dead. This was the first encounter this cavern saw of death, but it definitely wasn't the last. After the War of 1812, these caves were sold off and used as a place to mine salt. The workers of these mines were slaves and oftentimes were worked to death down there. After the salt had been mined, this place functioned as a spot for sick tuberculosis victims to go. Obviously, this created more death in this place and just contributed to what is a very haunted area now. Today, we get an array of ghostly apparitions popping up to people. Ghosts from all the way back 4,000 years ago have been seen, still lingering and clinging onto this cavern. People have seen the visions of slaves calling out for help and ghosts of sickly individuals as well. H.P. Lovecraft, one of the most famous fantasy horror writers, was inspired by this cave. Anything that inspired that guy is probably a spot that you want to avoid. And finally, number one on this list is Nada Tunnel. What is it about tunnels that's just so creepy? It feels like there are a few locations in the world that seem to attract paranormal activity and tunnels are definitely right up there. Virginia Travel Tips says, Nada Tunnel, also known as the Gateway to Red River Gorge, is located in Powell County, Kentucky. Works of a one-lane tunnel on a two-way road began in 1910 and concluded in 1911. Drills and dynamite were used to rip through the limestone rock during construction and one worker died while attempting to dissolve a stick of frozen dynamite by placing it next to the fire 
which, you know, resulted in the dynamite exploding. As a result, the man's spirit is claimed to haunt the Kentucky Tunnel. Others allege that the location is haunted as a result of a climber who died in this region. These incidents are linked to the mythology of a green orb appearing in front of the tunnel. If you plan to enter the tunnel, keep in mind that it only fits one automobile at a time, therefore check for other car headlights before proceeding. This is one of the coolest haunted places in Kentucky for the sake of it being engulfed in nature. So it may look really cool, but the haunted nature of this spot makes me think that it should be avoided. Man, imagine literally getting blown up by a stick of dynamite, like that might actually be the worst. Granted, my dude did stick the dynamite literally right next to a fire, so I feel like he might have brought this one on himself a little bit. I'm not really sure how the climber would have died in this tunnel, but you gotta imagine that he screwed up if he was climbing in a tunnel. Either way, the spot is definitely riddled with these spirits, and they manifest themselves as this glowing green orb. Now, there haven't been too many reports of this thing being super dangerous, but it is definitely creepy to say the least. Locals don't really travel down this pathway for fear of the orb, and what it could potentially do to them. Also, on a total side note, I just want to bring up the fact that this is a one-way tunnel on a two-lane road. Like, how dangerous is that, guys? What if it's foggy or something and I can't see all the way down the tunnel to the other car? That is literally the dumbest road design I have ever heard of. Maybe the legend was just created by the locals because they know how dangerous this freaking tunnel is. Regardless of what it is, I recommend staying away. In at number 5 we have the King Opera House. The King Opera House in Van Buren was built in the late 19th century but didn't get famous from the shows it hosted or its beautiful interior, but instead the Opera House is noted for its connection to a murder, and there are rumours that it is haunted by the murdered actor. It all began with actor Charles Tolson, who was the owner of the Tolson Stock Company, which was a travelling acting troupe. The troupe had just finished a week of performances at the King Opera House in September 1903. Three, and they were headed out of town to go to another performance. They headed to the train station and when Tolson made his way to the ticket window, someone called out his name. Dr. William Parman, a well-known local doctor, emerged and shot Tolson with his revolver. Tolson was shot in the hip and the chest and he was taken to the Fort Smith Hospital. But it was too late and he died from his injuries. Dr. Parchman's motive for the incident was that he believed his 17-year-old daughter was in love with Tolson, was planning on running away with him even though Tolson was married and his wife was a member of the acting troupe. Tolson knew Dr. Parchman and his daughter Ali, but there was no proof that he had any intention of eloping with the girl. Parchman was acting based on the information given to him by a vinegar salesman who may have had an interest in the young girl. Parchman was found not guilty of the murder despite there being multiple witnesses. Interestingly, both Ali and the vinegar salesman left town and were not present for the trial. It's said that Tolson's ghost haunts the King Opera House, which was the location of his last performance. Today, the Opera House is a contributing property to the Van Buren Historic District, listed on the National Register of Historic places. It isn't currently open to the public, but is available to be rented out. In at number 4 we have Toltec Mounds. The Toltec Mounds is a famous historical site in Arkansas and is a national historic landmark, one of four in the Arkansas State Park system, and this park is the largest and most complex mound site in the state. Arkansas was once the home of a group of people referred to as the Plum Bayou Culture by archaeologists and historians. Their existence in the area is a bit of a mystery. These people were not related to the Toltec tribes from Mexico, despite the site's name. The Plum Bayou culture also cannot be traced to any other group of people living in the area when the tribe was active. A total of 18 mounds have been identified in the area, all built between 650 and 1050 AD. One mound stands 49 feet high and another at 39 feet with many smaller mounds surrounding it. The site was abandoned around 1050 AD and no remnants of the residents exist outside of the Toltec mounds. Today the site is still an active archaeological site in the home of Toltec Mounds Archaeological State Park. As for hauntings at the site, if an entire culture disappearing without a trace isn't creepy enough, many visitors to the site have reported the appearance of lights or orbs near the mounds, seeing ghosts and hearing footsteps around the site at night. Many of these findings have been caught on camera and video, and so many paranormal investigators, ghost hunters, and haunting enthusiasts have confirmed there is activity in the area. Whether it's from the lost society or not, we may never know. The mounds are open daily for visitors, with tours available to learn more about the history and hauntings in the area. Coming in at number 3, we have the Golden North. 
North Hotel. The Skagway Golden North Hotel may look like a classic hotel located on the main street but it has seen tragedy and has the ghost to prove it. People say this place is haunted by a lady who passed away many years ago. She is bound to room 23 on the third floor but her presence can be felt in the area around the building. The locals tell the story of how this woman became bound to room 23. It's unknown in what year the story takes place but it was many years ago. The woman was visiting the hotel with her husband. They visited the area so her husband could go on a gold expedition. The expedition was over a number of days to possibly weeks and the wife was to stay at the hotel and explore the local area. The day arrived and the husband left on his expedition leaving his wife alone. Not long after the husband had left, the woman caught pneumonia. She became sicker and sicker. There was no one in the area able to help her. She had no way to get to a local doctor with no knowledge of the area. She sadly passed away in little over a week due to her illness. When her husband returned, he was heartbroken to find his wife had passed. She had been laying in their room for weeks awaiting his return. The locals were shocked to hear what had happened and horrified no one had heard her cries and helped her survive her ailment. Since then she has been bound to the room. Other guests have heard sounds coming from the room which remains empty. The spirit can be heard coughing or choking. Some have said they saw her from the window of the hotel when walking around the area late at night. Some have even heard her cries for her husband. When anyone tries to investigate the room they just find it empty and cold. The cold of the room takes over you as soon as you open the door. You can feel you are in the presence of a spirit and are overcome with sadness. Coming in at number 2 we have Independence Mine. The Independence Mine, now known as the Independence Mine State Historic Park, is the site of a former gold mining operation. It is located in Palmer, Alaska. The mining history in the area dates back to at least 1897. The mining town now sits abandoned. The operations were temporarily halted in 1950 with the plan to eventually resume operations. They were never able to resume the operations. This resulted in a well preserved collection of mining equipment and buildings. Although weather has taken its toll, many of the buildings still stand today. As we know with many mines there are often accidents due to the dangerous nature of the work. Parts of the mine would often collapse. The mine is now a big tourist site as a look into the life and work of miners in 1897. The visitors have reported a lot of paranormal activity while touring the facility. Almost everyone who visits the mine sees some form of activity there. There are many apparitions that appear. They walk around the mine as if they were doing their usual days work. Some have even seen cigar smoke coming from certain locations. You can smell and see the smoke but there are no cigars in the area that could be making the smoke. Tour guides have noted that they often have the feeling of being followed. They can feel themselves being watched each time they tour the facility. Some have even found footprints that don't belong to them or anyone in their group. Although there is a lot of paranormal activity in the area, tourists still come to see the remains of the mining town. The ghosts seem to be well intended. They may merely be echoes through time of the souls who passed here. As far as we know, there have not been any visitors who have been hurt during their visit. I would still be wary of visiting here though. Finally in at number 1 we have At The White House. At The White House was built in 1902 and is now on the National Historic Register due to how long it has been standing in the community. It has had many issues since it was built. It was originally built as a hospital then it was used as a daycare centre and today is used as a hotel. Any building that was used as a historic hospital has seen a lot of tragic passings. When the building was used as a daycare centre there was a tragic fire. The building caught fire in the 1980s. It was fully restored following this. During the fire the young woman who owned and ran the daycare was trapped inside. After ensuring all of the children were safe she became trapped and unfortunately perished. Since the fire her apparition has appeared around the home. Most guests believe her to be a kind spirit but she does bring on the feeling of dread and terror when she is in your presence. Guests at the hotel have claimed to be startled awake by the young woman standing at the foot of the bed. Once they wake up and become frightened the spirit usually disappears. Workers at the hotel claim that she appears to show more interest in families with children. She reportedly had a love for looking after children and even in death she wanted to ensure their safety during their stay at the hotel. It is unknown what room she was trapped in during the tragic fire but there are numerous cold spots around the hotel. Others have heard faint screams and cries coming from certain rooms. She is hailed as a hero for saving all of the children during the fire but guests are still frightened when greeted by her ghosts in the early hours of the morning. Number 5. Hockamock Swamp. Already sounds pretty scary in itself. Something about swamps, you know what I mean? 
During the 17th century, the Hockamock Swamp was used as a fortress by the Wampanoag people, the predominant band of natives in the area, against invasion by the early British settlers. It played a landscape role in King Philip's War as a strategic base of which to launch assault with nearby English settlements. During the 18th and 19th centuries, settlers deemed the swamp to be useless, barren land, and it didn't really do much besides sit there and just kind of take up space. They attempted to drain it and convert it into a profitable farmland, however, nothing really grew. The natives of the region placed a much higher value on the swamp, however, for centuries. The first people had relied on hunting food there, riddled with fauna, and the swamp had gained an important legend and folklore among them as being a place where many things meet. They named it Hakomak, the Algonquin term meaning place where spirits dwell. And that's exactly what people say they do dwell there. What makes this swamp so haunted is the different purposes it was used for. A cesspool for bones of the fallen. Some places are just more susceptible to violence and death over the years. And that reputation of spirits lingering is what's so heavy and cold about this location. Much of the swamp served a dual purpose as a sacred burial ground as well. The Hakomak is occasionally referred to as the home of the Hobomak. The Wampanoag people worshipped and feared Hobomak, the chief deity of death and disease. Hobomok, composed of human souls of the dead, was known to congregate in areas like the Hokomok Swamp. Thus the term and lore stuck. Yep, just a giant mud monster swallowing souls. Charming. There are many stories and legends that have become associated with the swamp and are even connected to the number one on my list. It remains a place of mystery and fear and apparently good frog catching. Number four, Lowell Cemetery. Lowell Cemetery is a cemetery located in Lowell, Massachusetts. Founded in 1841 and located on the banks of the Concord River, the cemetery is one of the oldest garden cemeteries in the country, making it a perfect place for violence and an eternity of soul searching. Many of Lowell's wealthy industrialists are buried here under lavish Victorian tombstones. Visitors have claimed that this is one of Massachusetts' most haunted cemeteries. What makes a haunted cemetery more haunted than another haunted cemetery, you know? Is there like a competition or like a quota or something? Just gotta keep the numbers up. What is it? I feel like every local claims their cemetery is the oldest and most haunted. And this brings me to our fair maiden here, the mysterious witch, Bonnie. A popular meeting place amongst the local teens at night for some scares and some screams, the statue of a woman with her arms outstretched on a rectangular tomb, her hands clutching a veil that falls down behind her body as though it were a cloak caught in the wind. Her eyes lay cold, staring at the heavens. Under her left eye, a black tear. Paranormal researchers have claimed that the statue holds more of an electromagnetic current and strange things can be seen in front and around the statue, making it seem like it's moving from time to time. Creepy. There is local lore that if you leave a coin or ribbon on the statue, then you'll get good luck, and in return, if you steal or take the items from the statue, the haunting whispers of bad karma will follow. Although research shows that this gravesite holds no actual sinister history, the ghostly sightings surrounding it are a hot spot within the cemetery. I bet at night under the moonlight, this woman could be very terrifying. Number three, the USS Salem. Planes, trains, and automobiles. Well, almost. A big boat, the USS Salem. A heavy cruiser built for World War II in 1945 was originally built for action. Its bold, aggressive architecture was one of the last as it was more of a bluff to its opponents than actually a hero of war. In May 1949, war departments handed the Salem's helm to Captain J.C. Daniel himself. The ship was built and updated with what was then the latest military tech and weapons, and it was meant to strike fear in whomever or whatever was in her way. Although the ship wasn't used in any action during World War II, it acted as a flagship, training operation, and main purpose as a threat to the naval enemy. It wasn't until the USS Salem had responded to the 1953 Ionian earthquake, or also known as the Great Kefalonia earthquake, as it hit the southern Ionian islands of Greece on August 12th, devastating the entire area. The USS Salem landed on Greek shores and acted as an improvised hospital and morgue, giving it its famous name, the Sea Witch. The ship was decommissioned shortly after its rescue and lays in Boston's harbor as a tourist attraction from all of its dark history. Some of the paranormal activities that arise on the ship include the Burning Man, who smells of rank death and can be seen in the mess hall where the bodies have been stored. Another famous apparition on the ship is the ghost girls who lurk the halls of the ship. Little ghostly figures can be seen and felt on the legs of tour goers. Some people claim that the ship is even home to hellhounds, an aggressive pack of ghostly creatures that roam the ship growling and scratching at closed doors. Yeah, the next time my dog scratches at my door, 
she's going up for adoption. I'm sorry. Number two, the Lizzie Borden House. This quaint bed and breakfast located at 232nd Street is home to one of America's most haunted and mysterious homes, the Lizzie Borden House. Gets its haunt from an unsolved murder of Lizzie Borden in 1892. One of the most infamous true crime figures known for her murdering of her father and stepmother with several blows to the head with a hatchet. Oof, ouch. Although acquitted, the killings remain unsolved to this day. This case earned notoriety and much that the popular local children's rhyme had been linked to this death. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. That is horrible. On August 4th, 1892, Lizzie's stepmother of 27 was struck 19 times while her father Andrew was hit 11. Although Lizzie Borden was acquitted and found not guilty, the dark history draws in crowds every night for its nightly tour of the premises. The Lizzie Borden room, the infamous room where all of the murders took place, is the most requested and most popular for paranormal overnighters. And not only can you enjoy a lovely inclusive breakfast to yourself, but the nightly house tour, ghost tour, and ghost hunt attracts fans of horror every night of the year. Yeah, that's terrifying. And there's a jingle to it. I don't like that at all. And coming in at number one, the Salem Witch Trials. We can't talk about haunted places in Massachusetts if we're not going to bring up the witch trials. And I'm not talking about Sabrina the Teenage Witch Witches or anything of cute of that nature. These famously documented witch trials need no introduction and unfortunately lays way to one of the most horrific events based in truth. The site of mass hysteria and hangings of supposed witches took place here and occurred in colonial Massachusetts between 1692 and 1693. More than 200 people were accused of practicing witchcraft or better known back then as the devil's magic and 20 were ultimately executed. Eventually the colony admitted the trials were a mistake and compensated the families of those convicted. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry. I just thought uh, when you sneezed, you didn't say bless you, so I just, I already don't like you, so I figured you were a witch. I'm really sorry. Since then, the story of the trials has become famous in paranoia and injustice, and it continues to baffle researchers to this day. We all know the famous play written by American playwright Arthur Miller in 1953, The Crucible, depicting the mass hysteria and drama during these trials. This was the perfect time if you didn't like someone that a strategic and untimely sinister accusation led to the demise of thy neighbor. I saw Sarah Good with the devil. I saw Goody Osborne with the devil. Who else don't I like? I saw Bridget Bishop with the devil. Abigail, end of act one. Since the start of the trials and hysteria in North America, other European countries shortly followed with their own mass witch hunts, resulting in somewhere between 40,000 and 60,000 tried and executed for witchcraft. That's a lot of broomsticks. The Salem Witch Trials of Salem, Massachusetts is still one of the world's biggest hotspots for mystery and paranormal story. Coming in at number 5 we have Terrace Inn. Located just north of the city of Petoskey lies the Victorian inn called Terrace Inn. The inn opened in 1911 and was known to be a luxury 38 room Victorian resort. Though the perception of the Terrace Inn has since changed from a large number of scary ghost reports, it also doesn't help that there have been multiple deaths on the premise. Before this building was an inn, it was two boarding houses until they were torn down to create what we now know as Terrace Inn. During construction, two workers fell off a beam and sadly passed away. Therefore, it's rumored that their spirits may have settled in at the inn once construction was complete. That's not the only accident and ghost story that has occurred at the Terrace Inn though, as many years later there was a woman named Abby Sweet who was staying at the inn. Abby was pregnant and unfortunately fell and lost her life. After that event occurred, her husband Edward passed away from heartbreak just a few years later. This accident occurred in room 211 which is known to have the most reports of ghost experiences and paranormal activity. That isn't the only spirit lurking in the inn though as there is the interactive youth. A boy between the ages of 12 to 14 who has been seen inhabiting the basement. That being said, his identity and the reason for his presence are unknown. Over the decades, there have been many reports of paranormal activity at the inn. If you ask the desk clerk for the inn's ghost files, they'll hand over a thick folder with accounts from past guests and employees. Even more frightening, it seems these reports may very well be true. 
as the reports span over 25 years written by strangers with similar ghost stories. Most reports from guests and workers are of hearing sounds of footsteps and voices late at night. Additionally, doors open and close by themselves unexplainably. Some have even reported hearing the sound of a piano playing or a party being held, but when investigated the area the sounds were coming from was vacant. Plenty of paranormal investigators have spent the night at this haunted hotel, and they all agree it's crawling with paranormal activity. Lucky for the guests though, the investigators and workers all agree that the spirits aren't harmful or hold negative energy. That all being said, this historic inn remains one of our most paranormally active locations in Michigan. In at number 4 we have Soul Choi Point Lighthouse. On the shores of Lake Michigan sits Soul Choi Point Lighthouse. The lighthouse has been in operation since 1895 and it's the only active light left on the lake, but behind its walls holds the stories and spirits. Between 1902 and 1910, Joseph Willie Townsend was the lighthouse keeper who lived in the upstairs bedroom with his wife. For decades, it's been said that Captain Willie Townsend remains attached to the old structure. The captain died at the age of 63 in 1910, and his death remains a mystery. Though some believed it was cancer, as he was known to be a heavy smoker. His body was embalmed in the basement of the lighthouse. Once Mr. Townsend died, some curious individuals got inside and went into the basement, where they found pieces of an old broken up kitchen table. Once they reassembled the table, that's when the paranormal activity began. The table chairs kept getting rearranged on their own and silverware was set on the table in a specific pattern, the way the captain preferred them. There have been multiple reports of a strong smell of cigar smoke within the lighthouse. Additionally, the captain's face has been seen in the upstairs bedroom mirror on 13 different occasions. The Sol Choi Point Lighthouse is one of the Upper Peninsula Paranormal Research Society's favourite spots to investigate due to its high activity from the paranormal. They have seen the alleged shadow of Townsend move behind the curtains of the lighthouse and have also seen him appear in a mirror. Not only that, but one guest had even said that during her visit she saw a man wearing a heavy blue coat walking across the yard of the lighthouse. She waved at the man, but he just ignored her. Not thinking much of it, she went on with her day. When the guests got home and did research on the lighthouse, she realised the man she saw was the captain himself. And to this day, those who visit Sol Choi Point Lighthouse leave with stories that turn non-believers into believers of the paranormal. Number 3 on this list is Central City Masonic Cemetery. Of course we had to have a cemetery on this list. No haunted place list would be complete without at least one of them. Thrillist says, founded as a mining town in the late 1800s, Central City is now known as a destination for those looking to head to the hills for a gambling fix in the casinos that now dot the area. But one thing hasn't changed. The the woman in black who twice a year appears in this hilltop cemetery above the town. Known as the Columbine Lady, she comes to visit the grave of John Cameron, a prominent former resident of Central City who died in 1884. Some believe she is his fiance, appearing to leave flowers for her lost love on November 1st, the anniversary of Cameron's death, and April 5th, a date for which the significance remains a mystery, much like the woman herself. This place is safe to go to if of course you do not go during these times. She's been coming for a long time and anyone who tried to interfere with her has had to pay the price. Now people kind of suspect that she was in a relationship with John Cameron, but there's also another theory. Many people think that John actually wronged her in his life, and that this woman in black comes twice a year to double check that John is still dead and hasn't come back to life by some means. Pretty scary tale for sure. One that you probably don't want to get involved with. Number two on this list is the Broadmoor. Located in Colorado Springs, this hotel would be freaking awesome if it wasn't so haunted. Thrillist says this sprawling five star hotel has a lot to offer for anyone seeking a relaxing and indulgent getaway. But along with the golf course, spa, and nearby zoo, there's one feature you won't find in any brochure. Staff and guests alike have reported the presence of a woman, often in the penthouse where Julia Penrose, co-founder of the property, once lived. While not confirmed, Penrose's death is said to have been surrounded by a strange occurrence in which she went missing and was later found, confused and shaking in the woods nearby with no memory of how she got there. She passed away a week later and perhaps her spirit remains watching over the property and seeking answers about her own mysterious death. Now I am wondering, man, how did Penrose die? Like this whole story feels like a movie or something like that.
that. I truly think somebody needs to get in here and investigate what the heck happened here. Cause like, should we be scared of the region because this is gonna happen again? Was Julia doing something specific before she disappeared and should we avoid doing that thing? There are just so many questions that need to be answered here and sadly I can't do it from the comfort of Toronto. That being said, I'm also not trying to end up like Julia and therefore we'll be leaving this job to somebody far more qualified. And finally, number one on this list is the Highlands Ranch Mansion. A truly picturesque mansion, one that's been standing for over 100 years and one that's home to a ghostly spirit. Thrillist says this sprawling stone mansion built in 1891 is often rented for weddings and events due to its impressive structural beauty and picturesque prairie views. But it's also a historic property and somewhat of a museum of the times with a bit of paranormal activity sprinkled in. The ghost of Julia Kistler, daughter of F. Kistler, who bought the property in 1926, is said to haunt the home with visitors and staff alike reporting hearing a woman's sobs, seeing a silhouette figure moving about when the mansion was otherwise vacant, and lights sporadically turning on and off. I don't know about you guys, but during my wedding ceremony, I want to hear beautiful sounding music, not the sobs of some ghost woman thing. Apparently she's crying all the time and this woman's emotions are not something to play with. There's a story where once several children were playing around here. There was a wedding ceremony scheduled here for later that day and the children were off doing what kids do before the proceedings got underway. They ran into this ghost crying and then they started to make fun of her. They were rude and definitely unkind but they also didn't deserve what she did next. It's said that in a fit of rage she flew inside their bodies and possessed each and every one of them for a short time showing them things that were truly terrifying. Things that have ultimately changed those boys' lives and altered their mentality forever. Any ghost that's capable of doing something like that, that's one that I don't want to be around. Kicking off the list at number five, the Landmark Inn. Located in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, right around Lake Superior, you'll find the Landmark Inn. Yeah, nice and cute and cozy. Come on in, take your coat off, stay a while. This fancy hotel was originally built in 1930 as a luxury accommodation for wealthy business owners from all around the United States. Sounds like a good time. Let's gather, let's talk, let's talk shop around candles. These business owners would visit the landmark to check on their business interests, all that good stuff. Though for its 100 years being open to guests, the hotel has had multiple reports of, you guessed it, ghosts and paranormal activity. It's so common at the Landmark Inn that the ghost hunters and paranormal investigators, they make trips out to the hotel quite often just to check in and be like, hey, how's it going? And they put on their gadgets and they just check in on them. They can rely on them. The hotel's sixth floor is home to one of the saddest stories the hotel has ever seen. This story takes place in the 1930s when the hotel was a new, lively social and cultural center in town. The story revolves around a ship worker who fell in love with a local librarian and conducted their love affair in the lilac room. Yeah, of all places, of course, let's go meet the lilac room. Sounds beautiful. And that was where the man was staying. Perfect place to meet. The couple was said to have a planned wedding upon his return from the last voyage on the sometimes treacherous Lake Superior. Unfortunately, their love affair ended in tragedy when his ship met with a storm and sank to the bottom of a lake. He never returned to the shore and the librarian mourned the man in said lilac room, eventually dying herself of a broken heart. The heartbreaking story comes with many reports of the lilac room now being haunted. Yeah, rightfully so. As a large number of guests has reported hearing cries and whispers from a female. The female is also seen by many guests and workers on the sixth floor near the lilac room, crying and mourning for her loved one. A less romantic story that is associated with the hotel goes back to when it was even finished being built. During construction, a man ended the life of his girlfriend due to anger and jealousy. And this took place right after she told them about her past boyfriends and their relationship history. Just normal stuff that he flipped out on as a monster. And since the hotel was still being built to conceal the evidence, the man buried her in the unfinished basement. Just horrible stuff. You knew I was going there and you're like, ah, oh, please don't. To this day, decades later, visitors and employees report hearing cries from that basement and some report hearing whispers from a female voice asking for them to find her body. I just got goosebumps. That's real goosebumps. No matter how much time goes by, these two women, heartbroken for different reasons, still haunt said hotel today. Number four, Michigan Bell Telephone Building. The Bell Telephone Building can be found in downtown Grand Rapids. It's known from the legend that the building is haunted by two ghosts. It's always two, eh? I always gotta have pairs. Good things come in pairs, even demons. These spirits have consistently caused chaos throughout the buildings for years in their own unique personal way. 
We love it. We love a unique ghost. The spirits that haunt the Bell Building are rumored to be Warren and Virginia Randall, a couple who used to reside in the Grand Rapids. Back in 1907, they moved from Detroit and bought the Judd White Mansion in Grand Rapids, which has now been torn down and built into what we now know as the Bell Telephone Building. So a lot of history there already. Over the years of living in this new house, Warren and Virginia's relationship started to crumble as Warren became very strange and paranoid almost, creating hardships in their relationship. In 1908, Virginia became tired of Warren's strange and aggressive behavior, so she decided decided, I'm out of here, peace. She left him. One night, three years after they were separated, Warren convinced Virginia into taking a car ride with him, you know, hoping to get back together, maybe talk it out. The two of them ended up at the Judd White House where their verbal disagreement turned horrible and Warren sadly took the life of Virginia. Then he proceeded to end his own life in the very same moment. The tragic accident that happened in the Judd White House became public knowledge and the house was left empty with no one wanting to occupy it. Yeah, more than fair. I'm like, what's rent? Also, what happened? No. The house remained abandoned for 10 years after the accident Accident until they finally just decided to tear the thing down completely. Thus, in 1924, they built the Bell Telephone Building on the ground, which still is in operation today. Yeah, they didn't tear that one down. That one's still going strong. Due to the horrifying scenes that happened on the grounds of the Bell Building, many claims that the spirits of Randall and Virginia still remain, haunting the new building. Some say the ghosts move into the new building and remain there to this day. I mean, I think that's possible. Ghosts like to move. They like to they can go through walls, they can probably relocate. Through the years of operation in the office building, visitors and employees all report being harassed by strange late night calls, which have been traced back to be coming from inside of the building itself. Yeah, inside the house, you guessed it, it's upstairs, that's so scary. Due to this and the strange eerie feelings that the employees feel while they're even working, it's safe to say Randall and Virginia may remain on the grounds, most likely, they're, they're definitely there. It sounds like they're there, they're for sure there. In at number three, we have Hotel Josephine. The Hotel Josephine is considered by many to be the most haunted hotel in Kansas. It was built in 1890, located in the city of Holton, and is the oldest consecutive operating hotel west of the Mississippi River. The history of the hotel is rich but also very haunted. The hotel was built by A.D. Walker and was named after his daughter Josephine. When it was built she was only four months old and she attended the local elementary school and graduated Kansas University. Her graduation photo was hung in the front parlor, above the antique piano, and according to the current hotel manager, Tracer Fox, her spirit is just one that is wandering the hotel. Tracer Fox has expressed his belief in the spirits when he first stayed at the hotel. He was woken up suddenly at 3.30am and his bed was moving. He figured there was an earthquake, but when nothing in the news confirmed it, he knew it was a spirit. His mother came and stayed in a room across from him and experienced the exact same thing he did with no explanation for it. They had been skeptics before these happenings, but they are both now firm believers. Other guests staying at the hotel have similar stories, as well as experiencing hearing strange sounds, laughter footsteps and seeing shadows. It has been expressed that spirits can be found on each floor. One of the most haunted rooms in the hotel is the Buffalo Room, where shadows are often seen and photographed in the mirrors around the room, as well as the Carry Nation Room. According to historical documents, a woman hanged herself in the bathroom of that room and many guests staying there have come out of the room clutching their necks and having a hard time breathing. The hotel has brought several famous guests over the years, including former US US President Grover Cleveland, who stayed there in between his two terms as president, along with Carrie Nation, Robert Louis Stevenson, Charles Curtis, Kirstie Alley, John Sullivan, Sam Raven, and Harry Langdon. Due to the amount of paranormal activity and active spirits in this hotel, the hotel hosts several paranormal and haunted events throughout the year, and many ghost hunters come to Holton to check out the more than century old hotel. It's also been featured in many television shows, including Coast Tours of Kansas and Haunted Rooms America. Coming in at number two, we have Mac McIntyre Villa. The McIntyre Villa is one of the unusual and historic houses built in the city of Atchison. It was built in 1889 for John McIntyre, a wealthy manufacturer of harnesses and saddles. He did a great deal of business with wagon trains plying the overland trails. John McIntyre's first wife, Alice, died in 1892. He married a second wife, Anna Conlon, a widow with three sons, and after John's death in 1902, Anna continued living in the home until her death in 1916. During her ownership, the house was home to many of her relatives, with lots of children as well. Around 1925, Anna's brother, Judge Charles J. Conlon, a prominent Atchison lawyer, and his family made the villa their home. In 1952, the McIntyre Villa was purchased by Miss Isabel Altus, a retired professional violinist and eccentric. She lacked the financial resources to be able to restore the home, and shortly before her death, she sold the home to George Gerardy in 1969, who started to rehabilitate the old estate. Many people past and present who have lived in and visited the home have experienced many 
many paranormal experiences. There have been figures being seen in windows when no one is home, lights turning on and off in the tower which doesn't have electricity, a speaker getting thrown off the counter and boxes mysteriously moving on their own, sounds of slamming doors throughout the night, footsteps walking down the hallway on the second floor throughout the night, the feeling of being watched, drastic temperature changes, voices, the scent of a woman's perfume and the hunt of cigarettes. The number of encounters and confirmed hauntings seen and heard around this home is crazy and it's considered to be one of the most active paranormal homes in all of the US. The amount of activity in this home makes it a hub for investigators, mediums, psychics and ghost hunters. They offer ghost tours of the home and you can stay overnight to try and encounter these spirits. And finally in at number 1 we have Sally House. The Sally House is said to be the most haunted place in Kansas. This home was built in the turn of the century and is located in the city of Atchison. After being built the home was bought by the Atchison physician who worked from his home. The front served as an office space and examination rooms and the upstairs is where the doctor and his family lived. One day a frantic mother arrived at the home carrying her young daughter Sally. The child had collapsed from severe abdominal pain. The doctor diagnosed appendicitis but there was no time to delay surgery. Sally unfortunately passed away on the operating table. For years after many believed Sally stayed to haunt the home and the haunting grew infamous in 1993 when the house was rented to a young couple. It started when the couples dog would growl at nothing and make even louder growls when near the upstairs nursery. Things began to take a violent turn when fires broke out in the house and a series of sinister attacks on the husband began. The former operating area would feel extremely cold and objects would visibly move when the young man came close. He could feel scratches on his chest and abdomen but the ghost never attacked the wife or baby. Not only did the former residents experience the paranormal activity but locals and other visitors of the home have experienced objects moving on their own, mysterious coldness, physical touches, video and investigative equipment that stopped working, trained guide dogs refusing to enter the nursery and unexplained scratches or bruising on their bodies during and after their visits. Psychics have visited the home and many have confirmed the presence of spirits in the home and have even communicated with them and many have entered as skeptics and left believers. Due to the number of experiences in the home it's gained a lot of media coverage from television channels including A&E, the Travel Channel, the Discovery Channel and the Sci-Fi Channel. The home is not currently occupied but holds many guided ghost tours for both daytime and even overnight visits for the ghost lovers and paranormal investigators. Beware though because a waiver is required due to the potential for personal injury but no serious injuries have been reported since the last tenants in 1993. In at number 5 we have Whispers Estate. The Whispers Estate was built around 1894 and between 1899 and 1901 is when Dr George and Sarah White moved in. George was a successful physician and ran his practice from their home. The two adopted many orphan children and unfortunately several passed away in the house over the years. Some of the children they took in were troubled. Many of them passed away in the bedrooms and other areas of the home and even some of Dr White's patients have been said to have also passed while in the home. Dr White practiced in the home for over 25 years so it's probable but unknown how many over the years had passed in the home. In the early 2000s the home underwent renovations and a lot of bizarre activity began. Many claimed that lights would flicker on and off, footsteps would be heard stomping around on the second floor and as time went on the activity escalated. To this day people reserve time to come and experience all this paranormal activity and are encouraged to write down any experiences they had while in the home and these accounts are posted to the Whispers Estates official Facebook page. You can go through the page and find creepy photos people have taken that show demonic figures, ghost like creatures and even orbs. It's also pretty common for the guests to be scratched up by unseen fingernails or touched by an unseen hand. The estate earned the Whispers moniker after the numerous guests that experienced somebody whispering in their ear, somebody they couldn't see. Due to the amount of people who have passed at the home in its early days it's like there are a number of different spirits that haunt the estate to this day. The Whispers estate is known as the fourth most haunted house in the United States but many who have visited believe it to be the most haunted house in the entire country. In at number 4 we have Rhodes Hotel. The Rhodes Hotel was established in 1893 and was named after the first owners Clara and Newton Rhodes. The youngest child in the Rhodes family Everett passed in one of the second story bedrooms after contracting tuberculosis at 18 years old. Soon after their daughter's death Newton unfortunately died and it's believed he had died inside of the house. After Newton's passing Clara turned the house into a dual brothel and speakeasy. It's said that one of the ladies of the night Sarah still haunts her bedroom tucked behind the stairs on the second floor. 
After Clara's death, the family home was opened as a hotel in the late 1800s and was meant to house those flocking to East Central Indiana during the natural gas boom. It's even believed that John Dillinger and Al Capone stopped at the hotel for a stay after hitching a ride on a train to Indiana. Not only did the family pass in their home, but a preacher by the name of Lester Poor supposedly hanged himself in the attic during the time when the home was converted to a hotel. But many believe his death could have been a murder. Due to the hotel's rich history, many locals and visitors have experienced paranormal activity, and everyone in the town knew that many spirits that passed in the building still haunt it to this day. The hotel closed its doors in 1937, and the property remained in the Rhodes family hands, but sat empty for more than 30 years. The hotel and its contents were eventually auctioned off, and it landed on the National Register of Historic Places. And the hotel saw three owners before the Haley's took it over for restoration. The Rhodes Hotel was purchased by Clint and Linda Haley in 1995, and they heard rumors about the haunting of the hotel, but this didn't faze them. They were more worried about the work they'd have to do to restore the home. The Haley's claim that they didn't encounter any paranormal activity, but many find that hard to believe. The hotel was up for sale again in 2017 when a man by the name of Couch took it over for his charity. Couch had launched the Lost Limbs Foundation four years earlier, which raised funds for prosthetic limbs for children. To this day, Couch's charity has owned and run the hotel. Not only had it been named among Indiana's most haunted places, but the hotel is consistently booked for private and paranormal investigations. The overnight investigation tickets can get up to $200, and this hotel attracts people from across the country. There have been many investigators that believe there is an extensive activity in this old hotel, and people have captured a figure like Shadow moving across the living room curtains with the use of night vision cameras. Most commonly, people hear whispers in the second floor creaking when no one is inside. Unlike the Haley's, Couch said he's seen and heard supernatural happenings in the hotel since moving onto the property in 2017. He's heard footsteps on the staircase. The property camera has turned off randomly and picked up voices before the footage flickers back on. Once while hosting an investigation, Couch said he witnessed one of many Victorian dolls left behind from a previous owner jump off of its chair. Number three, Boston Common. Most common fact about the common, one of the most haunted places in Boston. That rhymed really weird, didn't it? If you're out for a walk and feel the need to brush up on your American history, then you can be sure to either see the ladies by the trees or the Patriot men rushing the battlefront. Well, what's left behind from them at least. The Boston Common had a multi-purpose identity through the centuries. Originally as a farm and then trading grounds for the British and American military, the Common was used as a camp during the American Revolutionary War. 20 minutes to load these old muskets and a lot of people dying. It was also used for public hangings, up until 1817, most of which were from the large oaks, which were eventually all replaced with gallows in 1769. These grounds held weight during the witch trials and made a perfect open concept park that a spectacle could be enjoyed at. These people were sick. This place has seen its fair share of violence. The 350 year old park is full of graves, ghosts, and gallows. It's almost impossible to know just how many bodies lay underneath the park like a cesspool of unmarked graves from many different eras. Most buried here were low class sick or died in battle. Oh, and of course were hanged in front of the public. This place is home to many dark shadows, cold spots, and the occasional smell of gunpowder. Next time you're in Boston, swing by one of America's oldest and fullest cemeteries and see if you can see anything for yourself. Number two, the Danvers State Hospital. The Danvers State Hospital, or also known as the Danvers State Insane Asylum, was a psychiatric hospital located in Danvers, Massachusetts. It was built in 1874 and opened in 1878 on the isolated site in rural Massachusetts. Which, fun fact, the judge who preceded the Salem witch trial lived on. That's bad karma already, isn't it? Despite being included in the National Registry for Historical Places in 1984, the majority of the building was demolished in 2007. At a cost of $1.5 million at the time, the hospital originally consisted of two main center buildings with housing for the administration with four radiating wings on each side. The outermost wards were reserved for the most hostile patients. This was a prominent location where medications were being tested by the government and the favored lobotomy was being fleshed out. When shock therapy failed to control the population, lobotomies started and in 1939, the population of the hospital swelled to almost over 2,400 patients. A total of 278 people died at the hospital that same year. Neurology experts often call Danvers the birthplace of the prefrontal lobotomy. Ouch. 
Visitors to the hospital during these years reported lobotomy patients wandering around staring blankly at nothing, unaware of who they were or what they were doing. Large budget cuts in the 60s played a major role in the progression of closing the Danvers State Hospital, and with nicknames like Hell Hill Hospital and the Lunatic Asylum, the hospital began slowly closing its facilities by 1985. The original hospital wards were closed and abandoned soon after. During the 80s, reports began to filter out of the hospital about missing teenage patients. The stories of ghostly figures and shadows in the windows were thriving. Are the ghosts of the lobotomized patients still aimlessly walking the realms of this now demolished hospital? What do you think? And number one, the Bridgewater Triangle. Just a couple miles south of Boston is one of the most interesting and bizarre places in Massachusetts. I chose this as the number one spot due to not only the paranormal ghostly figures that have been seen across the vast plains, but 200 miles of connected weird events that will definitely catch our attention. It's named from the triangle shape, the paranormal events and phenomenon that occurs within these mapped lines includes as many as orbs, UFOs, Bigfoots, fairies, skinwalkers, alien hybrids, you name it, it's there. Well, possibly there. The towns of Raynham, Brockton, Norton, and Totten are all subject to a universal head scratcher. In the 70s there of course was a surge of UFO witnesses, at the same time several Bigfoot. Huh, that's interesting. Massachusetts just keeps getting stranger and stranger, doesn't it? Huge humanoid creatures, motherships, and landed UFOs have also been spotted and reported within this 200 square foot mile radius. Do you think this place is like a Skinwalker Ranch type of place? Maybe some motherships are trying to just reconnect with the Wi-Fi upstairs? I don't know. Whatever it is, the Bridgewater Triangle has been home to numerous documentaries and folklore and attracts spooky goers each year with its variety of paranormal activity. Coming in at number 5 we have William A. Irvin. During the fall season the ship has haunted tours with actors but the ship really is haunted. The haunted ship began in Duluth in 1992. Before the haunted ship started the William A. Irvin was open for regular boat tours during the month of October. Historically this month was really slow and the DECC needed a way to generate more revenue during this quiet month. Having heard about a failed attempt by Cleveland's William G. Mather trying to become a haunted ship, the DECC decided to try their own hands at a haunted attraction. The William A. Irvin partnered up with UMD to give the school's drama department some experience on production and acting. Needless to say, their attempt was a huge success. More than two decades later, the haunted ship is the peak of the Irvin's yearly business. The most common sighting that employees relate is that a lady in white has been seen walking around the ship. No Simply. She is usually up on deck and is dressed in period clothing. Nobody has ever been able to identify who she is or why she is tied to the vessel. There is also said to be a former captain who is still overseeing his ship. He is most often seen in the captain's chair and is said to be angry that the ship remains in dock and is no longer seaworthy. There are another two men haunting the ship. One sticks to the front of the ship and apparently does not understand what has happened to him, while the other sticks to the rear of the ship and has confirmed that he died after falling from a ladder. The family of the second a man has come forward and said the story surrounding his death was always suspicious and they were denied a claim to his pension. In a number 4 we have Enger Tower. The 82 year old watchtower can be found right in the middle of Enger Par. The tower was built in 1939 and looks over the Duluth Harbour, being known as one of the most well known haunted places in Minnesota and for good reason. The tower is 531 feet above Lake Superior and is built of bluestone from local sources. Enger Tower was first dedicated by Crown Prince Olaf and Crown Crown Princess Martha of Norway on June 15th. It was built as a tribute to businessman Bert Enger, who passed away in 1931. The dedication was in honor of Bert Enger, a native of Norway who came to this country and became a successful furniture dealer. At the time of his death, Mr. Enger donated two thirds of his estate to the city of Duluth. This included the land known as Enger Hill, which, along with Enger Tower, is also the home of Enger Park and Enger Golf Course. The tower can be seen almost anywhere throughout the city and has since been restored. There is a local legend that a man took his own life in 1948 by jumping off the fifth level of Enger Tower. They say his body has been found hours later but was never identified. That being said, there are numerous ghost stories of visitors seeing a man on the fifth floor of the tower before entering, but when they reach the top, he is gone. Number 3 on this list is Fort Fisher. Fort Fisher was a critical fort during the American Civil War. It was used by the Confederate Army and was pretty instrumental for them from 1861 to 1865. This fort was used to protect an important trade post there that the army needed. They defended this place for those four years, but then in 1865, the Union Army came in and was finally able to capture it. This battle was a very bloody one and was actually huge for the Union Army in the overall scope of the 
war. Apparently there was a lot of death at this fort and that death it's never really gone away. Now this fort is teeming with paranormal activity. Visitors will often report hearing gunshots coming from thin air. The sounds of many footsteps all running at once as if people were charging ahead. Orbs of energy appear in front of them from no apparent source. There are two very famous ghosts that haunt this place as well. Robert E. Harrell and General William Whitling. Robert was apparently an outcast who died under mysterious circumstances and has not been able to rest since. The General was actually taken prisoner and killed at Fort Columbus, but he returned to this place because he feels regret for how he failed in life. He was apparently responsible for defending this place and was not capable of doing so. A very haunted fort that I wouldn't recommend going to. Number two on this list is Lydia's Bridge. Who is Lydia and why does she have a bridge and why is it haunted? Well, Lydia is quite the famous ghost. This is a true ghost. Like when you think of a ghost and a ghost story, this meets all the criteria for a good one. Spectrum Local News says, people traveling between Jamestown and Greensboro on US Highway 70A said they've encountered the ghost of Lydia, a hitchhiker. If she's picked up, she gets into the car and vanishes before she reaches the requested destination. Various versions of the Lydia legend have been passed along over the years, and there are apparently 11 different versions of the story that are set in North North Carolina. It's common for folks to go ghost hunting for Lydia near the bridge. In the book, Looking for Lydia, historians Michael Reniger and Amy Greer cite the 1923 death of Annie C. Johnson as the real life Lydia who died after a car flipped in 1920. That is a story with some history, man. Literally since the 1920s, this has been going on and there are 11 different versions of the story. A story like this isn't just made up. It's not just something that one person posted on creepypasta that became a thing. No, this has been part of the identity of North Carolina for a century. Countless people have picked up this woman and then had her disappear right before their very eyes. Car accidents have happened for people driving this woman and then getting so shocked that they spin off the road when she disappears. Lydia or Annie is a real ghost who stalks drivers along this road and especially this bridge. Although she isn't inherently evil in nature, as I said before, accidents have happened when people realize they were just driving a ghost around. I have no idea where Lydia is trying to get to, but trust me, you probably don't want to be the person to take her there. And finally, number one on this list is the Devil's Tramping Grounds. This is in reference to a very strange patch of soil in North Carolina. For decades, this circle of dirt has allowed nothing to grow on it at all whilst the area surrounding it is home to luscious wildlife. The Sun Journal says, regional legend maintains that Satan frequents the area on his nightly walks, pacing the circle as he contemplates his nefarious deeds. Normal vegetation surrounds the circle but only a wiry grass grows inside it and no plant life of any kind can be found on the path itself. Visitors have also claimed to see red glowing eyes in the circle. Now there could be any number of reasons for why nothing is growing on this patch of dirt. Simply because an area of land cannot grow wildlife doesn't automatically mean the devil himself has anything to do with it. But throw in the fact that there are two red glowing eyes there plus a few other creepy occurrences and we might just have something demonic afoot. Locals have reported putting objects in the center of the circle, then coming back a little while later and having those same items moved outside the circle. As if someone or something did this deliberately. The thinking is that this circle is a place used by the devil to dance or to perform rituals that we don't understand. Having things inside his circle of death doesn't make for a great dancing spot or sacrificial zone, so those things need to get moved. That's why we see the red eyes in the night and there's an overwhelming sensation of dread in the area. It's the devil doing his devilish things. A daring reporter actually decided to test this theory one evening and slept in the exact spot in a tent. He said that the entire evening he heard the distinct sounds of dancing footprints outside his tent, but couldn't spot anything when he looked out. My dude literally could have been like one foot away from the actual devil. No idea how he managed to make it through the entire Entire night, but honestly, solid respect. Either way, this guy's story is an exception, not the norm. I'd avoid this place at all costs, because if you don't, the devil might actually make you pay for it. Number five on this list is the Seal Hotel. 
Seelbach Hotel is located in the heart of Louisville and has been there for quite some time. Virginia Travel Tip says, In 1905, the Seelbach Hotel in Louisville opened its doors. For more than a century, this exquisite historic hotel has functioned as one of Kentucky's most important historical landmarks. The hotel, on the other hand, is notorious for its ghostly activity. Patricia Wilson, the Lady in Blue, is one of the hotel's most famous sightings. She was a woman who had recently divorced her spouse and intended to meet him later at Sealback to try and work out their differences. Unfortunately, her husband died in a car accident and never showed up. She was devastated by the loss and she died not long after that. As a result, guests notice a woman in a blue outfit strolling around the hotel. Other ghosts have been reported at the hotel and they include a woman dressed in old, worn out clothing who was approached by a staff member attempting to communicate with her, but then she disappeared. Most of the encounters with this woman have been tame, but there have been some that have gotten quite aggressive. Some teenagers were apparently making fun of her or doing something that they shouldn't have been doing, and she responded by literally clawing and scratching at one of them, leaving horrible marks behind. The victim also said that it felt as if she crawled into his brain and told him horrible secrets about himself that he'll never be able to forget. A hotel like this is supposed to be nice and relaxing, but based on what I've read, I don't know if that's going to be the experience you get at Sealbach. Number four on this list is the Talbot Tavern. Really too bad that this place is haunted because it would have been a pretty nice spot to get a brew if it wasn't. Virginia Travel Tip says, built in 1778, the Talbot Tavern is located in Bardstown, Kentucky. Currently, the Haunted Kentucky Tavern serves as both a restaurant and a five room B&B and it's known for being haunted. A former accountant recalls coming across a man in a long coat strolling across the top floor. He then turned to face her and began laughing uncontrollably. Another famous hotel resident was the lady in white who forced a couple to flee the hotel in the middle of the night since she was hovering over them while sleeping. Many workers and visitors to the residence have related accounts such as orbs floating around the rooms, flashes of lights without cameras being seen, objects moving on their own, and doors opening and closing when no one's in the building. I, for one, am not trying to wake up to a ghost just hovering over me, guys. Honestly, it might give me a heart attack and, well, I'd never wake up again. This place is weird because no one really knows why it's as haunted as it is, but there's no doubt that it's teeming with paranormal energy. Pick a different place to go get a drink if you're in Kentucky. In at number three, we have Mackinac Island. One of Michigan's most popular tourist destinations is also one of its most haunted, Mackinac Island. The small island sits on Lake Huron, covering almost four square miles of land between the upper and lower peninsulas of Michigan. The island was originally home to indigenous settlements long before European colonization. Seeing at least two battles during the War of 1812, it has been the resting ground of many tragic deaths, making it a prime location for hauntings and paranormal activity. In a part of the island, you will find the Grand Hotel. The area first served as a missionary school, but today it's known as a luxury hotel. Through investigators, there have been many reports of paranormal activity in the area, and it's known that the Grand Hotel is one of the hotspots for paranormal activity on the island. Legend has it that construction workers uncovered human remains while digging the hotel's foundation. With paranormal activity stories being recorded in the theatre, outside grounds and in its rooms. The staff have also reported seeing a man in a top hat playing the bar's piano. Others see a woman in Victorian clothing who roams the halls, even getting into beds. Another paranormal hotspot is the Mission Point Resort, which was a moral realignment, a religious movement from the 1930s. The resort's popular ghost stories about a man named Harvey who died in the late 1960s. Supposedly, Harvey was dealing with a broken heart and ended his life behind the resort, not being found until six months later. Some people believe there's more to the story, that he was perhaps murdered. That being said, Harvey is often reported in the resort's theatre, where visitors have reported being pinched or poked. With the never-ending ghost stories and paranormal reports, the island is deemed the most haunted town per capita in the United States. With 16 haunted 
haunted locations per 478 people. It is safe to say that there are some paranormal activities and ghosts lurking on the grounds of the island. Coming in at number 2 we have Holly Hotel. Due to the growing number of railroad passengers passing through the area, the hotel was built in 1891. Many staff, residents and haunted historians will agree that the Holly Hotel is one of the most haunted buildings in the state of Michigan. Norman Gauthier, a professor of parapsychology who is also known as a world famous ghost hunter, investigated the hotel in 1989 and concluded that the building is indeed haunted by a great number of spirits. Throughout the years the hotel survived two fires exactly 65 years apart. Many residents and guests of the hotel have talked about the weird feelings they got on the second floor of the hotel without us actually admitting to seeing ghosts. The inner's most famous ghost is said to be the former owner himself, Mr. Hurst. Hurst passed away in the 1920s but many believe he just can't let go of his hotel. He is the most active ghost at the Holly Hotel and wasn't happy with the renovations that have been done to his inn. The rumour is if you see a man wearing a frock coat and top hat and smell cigars you most likely have met the man himself. The other most common spirit would be with the former hostess Nora Kane. According to the hotel Nora's ghost is seen most often in the bar and back hallway. She has been heard playing the piano or softly singing a tune throughout the hotel and her flowery perfumes can be faintly smelt when she is around. Those are only the two most common spirits of the Holly Hotel though there are so many more encounters reported by visitors and ghost hunters. And finally in at number 1 we have Beeson Mansion. Found in Niles, Michigan sits an old mansion that was built in 1847. The home was constructed by a local whiskey distiller who sold it to an attorney Strother Beeson and that's why it was referred to as the Beeson Mansion. Across the street of the mansion lies the family's private cemetery. Strother built the tomb across the street as a final resting place for his mother and it wasn't too long afterward another family member joined the cemetery. Strother's son born in 1969 tragically passed away and a total of 12 family members are now entombed in the crypt. The ghost stories surrounding the Beeson mausoleum are at least based on truth, if not completely true. Family legends about Harriet's odd behaviour were cited in newspapers over time but not until much later accompanied by reporting on unverifiable hauntings. Jumping to the late 1980s when working to restore the mansion the property owner reported hitting their head on a table in the hall but something hitting them on the back. As well they experienced instances of being pushed forward by an unknown force. Additionally the doors would open and close behind them unexplainably. The renovated mansion is vacant now but no one dares to buy it due to the many cases of hauntings and paranormal activity. And coming in at number 5 we have the Houghton Mansion. Built in the 1890s in North Adams, Massachusetts, for the mayor himself, Albert Charles Houghton, this neoclassical revival style mansion sits on 172 Church Street. A family man, Albert, was the president of Arnold Printworks, a prominent textile factory in North Adams. His wife, Cordelia, daughter Mary, and himself had owned and lived on the property right up until the fatal car accident which took the lives of the family in 1914. On an early summer morning, Albert and his family, accompanied by another family, Dr. And Mrs. Dutton and their daughter, and of course the family chauffeur himself, Mr. Witters, had decided to head out into the countryside for a leisurely drive, a drive that ultimately took their lives. Unfortunately, for everyone on that August 1st morning, after a steep turn, the car lost control and proceeded to screech off the road, resulting in a rolling fatal wreck. All the women in this tragedy losing their lives, with the men barely surviving from the multitude of injuries. On August 11th, just 10 days after the accident, without his wife and daughter, Albert mysteriously died in the home from what doctors think was a broken heart. It is said that three ghosts haunt the Houghton Mansion, including Albert himself, Albert's daughter Mary, and the driver, Mr. Witters. The mansion remained with the Houghton family until 1926 when Albert's daughter Florence and her husband sold the building to the Freemasons. This is when the spookiness really started happening. Through its multitude of use throughout the years, additions to this historic site were added on by the Masons, using it for ritual and spiritual purposes, making this story even weirder. Over over the years there have been countless paranormal witnesses claiming that the ghosts roaming the halls of the basement. Mr. Witters himself, guilt ridden with the responsibility of the crash and Mr. Witters took his own life shortly after returning home with injuries and residents that have stayed at the site have claimed that the manly figure aimlessly rummaging through the basement is the driver himself. Among these claims have another spirit lurking in Mary's bedroom. It is said that overnighters have witnessed multiple bright lights and auras flying around the bedroom in the middle of the night. I wouldn't even step foot into this house let alone set up camp and spend the night. 
No way. The Houghton Mansion remains a tourist attraction and hotspot for paranormal goers worldwide and to this day is one of the most haunted and mysterious sites in all of Massachusetts. Number 4. The Hoosick Tunnel The Hoosick Tunnel, from the Algonquin word place of stones and the Mohawk word forbidden, is a 4.75 mile active railroad tunnel in western Massachusetts that passes through the Hoosick Range, an extension of Vermont's Green Mountains and runs from Deerfield River in the town of Florida to the city of North Adams. The construction began in 1815 and ending in 1875 with a budget of 2 million, at the time the largest tunnel ever constructed and it was later the result of taking lives of over 200 men during its construction entirety, earning it the nickname from locals, the Bloody Pit. This haunted, barren, five mile, completely enclosed stretch was subject to multiple accidents and deaths over the years, giving the tunnel its haunting history and reputation of being cursed itself. With the word forbidden, did the Mohawks know something that the workers didn't? Essentially, this cold, underground, pitch black hole became one of America's strangest gravesites, resulting in everything from mysterious gas leaks, dynamite explosions, roofs collapsing, and even mechanic failures resulting in a mass flood. For the past decades, there have been numerous paranormal activity witnesses who have documented strange events from police officers to the freight conductors themselves. Some of the reports over the last 100 years included numerous farmers and wagons ending up in different areas of the railroad, missing hours of time. The farmers had claimed that when spending time around the railroad and its tracks, that memory and confusion would always set in. Some residents have claimed that they have even been chased out of the tunnel by an unexpected freight train chugging along aggressively through the tunnel like a bat out of hell, and then vanishing. Numerous ghostly figures resembling workers roam the dark tunnel, and if that isn't scary enough, some people, including hearing the echoes and screams of even the workers who were buried alive under the rock, still holding their tools, or even seeing ghostly figures in pumping chambers where numerous men tirelessly making rafts not to drown. The Hoosick Tunnel remains one of the most visited and haunted places, marking it just one of the sites you'll probably never find me at. Just in 2020, the tunnel was yet again subject to a mysterious collapse resulting in months of repair. Yeah, I say stop fixing it and just let it be. Number three on this list is the Hex House. Yeah, that's right guys, this place is literally called the Hex House, so it's no wonder why it's making the list. News Oklahoma says again, so this is something we feature in our serial killer tour. The new Hex House is inspired by the home that used to belong to Carol Ann Smith. French said the original Hex House, located at 10 East 21st Street, has negative energy attached. I mean, the things that she did with her nephew. They were dumping hot water on people that lived in the duplex next to them. There's also that whole history of her keeping those two hostages in the basement and kind of hypnotizing them, putting hexes on them. Yes, it's insane, said French. Claims of windshield wipers or stereos going on while the car is off are frequent if parked nearby. French even says they tested the theory during a tour and claimed she never did it again. We turned the bus off, but then it wouldn't start back up. It wasn't until a lady said she called Carol Ann a bad name and then she apologized. As soon as she was done, the bus came immediately back on, French says. The reason this house is on the killer tour list is due to what went down in 1928, guys. John Blymere, after receiving consultation from a woman named Nellie Knoll, thought that he had been cursed by another man named Nelson Raymer. John and some of his friends broke into the home, which is the Hex House, and then brutally killed Nelson. After they did this, they tried to set the house on fire, but it actually didn't burn. Since then, it's been a hotspot for ghosts, specifically that of Nelson Raymer. Number two on this list is the Stone Lion in Bed and Breakfast. This is definitely not the Airbnb you want to be booking for you and your pals for that relaxing weekend getaway you've been picturing. Travel Oklahoma says, stay at the Stone Lion Inn Bed and Breakfast in Guthrie at your own risk as a mischievous ghost child has been seen and felt throughout the home. The spirit, said to be that of 8 year old Irene Hewton, has been known to squeeze the toes of sleeping guests or even crawl into bed with them. The eerie tap 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 of a child's footsteps has also been heard leading from the second floor to the third. According to legend, the 8,000 square foot home was where the child met her fate when a nurse her with cough syrup containing them. The family later moved on, but little Irene refused to leave. After the Houston family moved out, the home changed into a boarding house and then a funeral home. 
Paranormal investigative teams have encountered several other ghosts, including a strong male entity who lingers in the basement where the morgue once was. Through the years of people staying here, there have been tons of reports of sightings and interactions with ghostly entities. As mentioned, it's pretty normal to be visited by Irene, the ghost of the young girl who passed here. A bit of a rarer encounter is that of a ghostly music box, though. The owner Becky has come out and said, One of my guests just the other day came out of this room and said, All night long I heard this music box. Now it's unclear whether one of the ghosts was playing this music box, or if the box just sort of started on its own, but that would definitely be enough to keep me awake if I was that guest. Pictures, videos, and voice recordings have all been captured here by paranormal investigators many times. It was first investigated by a paranormal specialist 18 years ago, and since then it's been a hotspot for all ghost hunters alike to check out. Unless you're well versed in dealings with spirits, I'd pick a different Airbnb for you and your buddies. And number one on this list is Guthrie's Boys Home. This site started out as an orphanage in 1923 when it was built. Now becoming an orphan would truly be a horrible experience that I can't even begin to understand, but I can guarantee you that it would have been far worse if you got sent to this orphanage. That's because of the horrible atrocities committed here. There is no denying that the maid who worked here back then was sick. Mentally sick, deranged to a point where she felt a desire to these young orphans. It's believed that she would often abuse these innocent children in any number of ways. Now this isn't confirmed, but these are rumors. It's also thought that she even took the life of a few people while she was working here and made it look like an accident. This all culminated one day when she finally took her own life by jumping out of the bell tower and falling to her death. This has obviously led to some spiritual presences staying behind. Lucky for all of us, it's not the spirit of this sick old maid who died. However, as sad as it is, it's the spirits of some of these children here who were wronged. There is apparently one girl who appears to visitors and begs for safety. Crying and screaming children can be heard echoing throughout the building at all hours of the day. The sounds of little feet running up and down the halls are regularly reported as well. Believe it or not, this isn't enough to drive people away though because it's a popular wedding spot. Definitely not the area I would choose to get married if it was up to me though. Number 5 on this list is the Carolina Inn. This inn has actually been voted one of the most haunted in America by a few different lists. The University of North Carolina says the Carolina Inn was built in 1924 and quickly became a popular hotel for visitors and graduates of the university. In 1948, the Carolina Inn's most long-lasting guests checked in and apparently never left. Dr. William Jacox was a fun-loving man with a witty sense of humor, had recently retired from practicing medicine, and decided to make the Carolina Inn his final home. He lived in room 252 for 17 years before his death in 1965. As shared by the Carolina Inn, guests that have stayed in Jacox's old room report being inexplicably locked out of the suite. One time, the lock was so stubborn that a workman had to use a ladder to break into the room. Visitors have also noticed strange occurrences such as messy bath mats and previously closed curtains being pulled wide open. Some have encountered the smell of freshly cut flowers despite none being in the room and felt their bodies become strangely cold for no apparent reason. This is only part of the stuff that goes down at this room as well guys. Some people have reported seeing a poorly dressed man approach them looking for an unlocked door and then if they show it to him, he runs away screaming. It's thought that this is the ghost of Dr. William Jacox. I don't know why unlocked doors scare this dude so much, but anyone who's gonna spend 17 years in this hotel is probably a bit of a weird dude. Unless you want to deal with a crazy old doctor ghost messing with you all vacation, I'd stay at a different inn. Number 4 on this list is the New Hanover County Library. I don't know why guys, but something about haunted libraries is just so intriguing to me. Like it just seems so mystical and mysterious I guess. This haunted library is located right in Wilmington. There is a woman that haunts this place who's believed to be a patron. Apparently she used to donate quite generously to this library and in death doesn't want to leave it behind. She's not the only ghost that walks the halls here and haunts the books. There's a male poltergeist who makes his presence quite known as well. He apparently died in a duel that happened here many years ago before this land was turned into a library. 
Nowadays, these two ghosts make it very hard to do any serious learning or studying considering they haunt the place so much. The woman isn't too bad, she just shows up and looks super creepy, but from my reading, she only actually punishes those who cause harm to the library or make fun of it. Those who come here to learn and to read, she leaves them be for the most part. The man, however, is certainly quite the pest. He often messes with those that come here and makes it very difficult for people to accomplish anything. I love libraries, I think that we should all go to them more often, but maybe just not this one specifically. Number three, the Henderson Castle. Established in 1895, this castle is a hub for many spirits and paranormal activity. I mean, it's a castle. The original owners, Frank and Mary Henderson, are said to haunt the castle as they passed away back in 1899. Yeah, I wouldn't want to leave either, living or dead. Additionally, other spirits are said to reside in the castle, a young girl and a dog. Yeah, a dog, we've got a dog ghost. How do you deal with that? Ghost barks? That'd be so scary. In 2005, the castle was occupied by Peter Livingstone McNellis and his family. When the family resided in the castle, Livingstone's son, Vincent, before anyone else had ever reported anything strange happening in the house, he said that he saw an apparition of a figure in the Victorian room. Originally, the changing room for one Mary Henderson. The son said while pointing at a picture of a woman dressed in an old period clothing, some Victorian clothing, that that was the woman he saw wearing that same clothing. I would throw up. If someone ever said that, I'd be like, oh, this Victorian painting? And one former innkeeper who stayed at the castle each night told Livingstone on numerous occasions that she also felt a presence coming up and down the staircase. A movement passing her on the stairs when she would walk by. Ugh, these are scary. Top five is like, you know, or top 10 is scary fish. This is, this is hard. This is some scary stuff. 9 a.m. I'm already getting spooked. While now the castle is being used for a bed and breakfast, guests have fallen victim to ghosts as well. Yeah, it's not over yet. The Henderson Castle is a very paranormal active ground that many ghost hunters have investigated and they've confirmed, in fact, that it's haunted by spirits. I trust them. The people that can go into these castles and physically do this, I'm like, yep, I trust your opinion, whatever. He just comes out, he's like, haunted. We're like, thanks, Daryl. This has been confirmed as these ghosts have interacted with many paranormal investigator teams in addition to guests and employees of the castle. Yeah, they're just and everyone. The ghosts seem to be friendly, not evil whatsoever, so that's a good side, I guess, to being uh, haunted by ghosts. They have been known to speak and physically touch guests and employees. Just, they touch them on their back, side, shoulder. Always in the back, you never see it coming. It's always in, always in this region. Not only that, but there's also been reports of radios making weird noises or turning on by themselves, even though they're either unplugged or just either turned off. Both bad, both scary. Guests and employees have also reported hearing footsteps upstairs, slamming doors from unexplainable sources, and some ghosts have been wearing the clothes that they wore while they were alive. Clothes that they wore while they died in, probably. As the spirit of Mary Henderson has been reported as many guests at the top of the staircase, wearing her usual getup. Imagine being like a clown, like a jester, and then you die in that, and that's what you look like as a ghost. You're like, what? I was doing a mascot gig. I don't look like a shark forever. Number two, Elegant Hodge. The old Elegant Elk Lodge was built in 1909. It was used as a psychiatric and TB hospital until its closure in 1948. The lodge was a former hospital that was frequented by mobster Al Capone and one that many say is haunted by at least seven different ghosts. Yeah, you thought, you thought two was bad. Add five more, now we got seven ghosts. And it's currently on the auction block in Elegant. If you have a lot of money and bravery, there you go. While the structure was originally built by physician John Robinson in 1909, somewhere in the 1920s, it was sold to a doctor from the Chicago area who had allegedly had underworld ties. That's a great doctor. He gets just who you want working on your pancreas. Brought pancreas back today. The facility was supposedly frequented by mafia figures such as Al Capone, the Prohibition era Chicago mob boss, and his men. Yeah, when they needed medical attention or when they simply needed to get away from Chicago, this is where they'd go. The, the old Elks Lodge, Al Capone. He's like, oh, it's cozy. They have great soup. <laughs> Years later, it was used as an Eagles Lodge and an Elks Lodge. And in 2010, it was acquired by an elegant woman who began renovating the property, but now she wants to sell it. Yeah, can't imagine why. Because one of the former doctors who owns the lodge had underworld ties, maybe? Something like that? I don't know. It led to a lot of people believing that there's a lot of undercover stuff about this lodge. It's still happening to this day. I don't know why I'm doing this like it's like over there, but I'm like, there's something going on in that lodge. Especially as it's known to hold seven different paranormal entities, like I mentioned previously. For many years, employees and visitors have told stories of spirits who relentlessly roam the building. Some of the paranormal activity that has been experienced here includes cabinets opening up by themselves in the kitchen, sounds of children laughing. It's always 
calming in the morning, photographic anomalies captured throughout the building, and like you name it, shadowy figures in the basement, all bad. Notably where the morgue was located, the basement, good stuff, a lot of, a lot of stuff happening in there. There'd be knocking on the front door, indiscernible conversations, and ringing at the doorbell when no one was present. Yeah, good stuff. Again, I have, uh, I have goosebumps, they're back. Guests also heard footsteps and the sound of hospital activity long after being used as one. They'd also see full-bodied apparitions of, uh, of children. They would just see ghost children. That would be it. I wouldn't have to see any more. I would just see the ghost children and be like, again, see ya. Like that's... And finally, number one, point O Barks Lighthouse. There are plenty of lighthouses in Michigan and plenty of them are rumored to be haunted, of course, because they're lighthouses and they're creepy, as they normally are. And this one is no exception. Built in 1847, real old, real, a lot of history with this one. The lighthouse is located on point O Barks. As the legend goes, early to mid 1800s, Peter Shook had been point O Barks' first lighthouse keeper. He was the OG. In 1849, Peter drowned while he and a couple of friends were sailing to Port Huron to pick up supplies for the lighthouse. He left behind eight kids and his wife, Catherine, and she took over at that point for Peter's duties, thus becoming Michigan's first female lighthouse keeper. Since then, people have claimed to see the spirit of Catherine walking along the edge of a cliff dressed in mourning clothes as she is still heartbroken by the loss of her lover, of course. As we talked about earlier, ghosts like to wear the things that they were, you know, that they passed away in. Again, would hate to be a clown outfit. That would suck. She had also been spotted in the window of the second floor wearing an apron, along with an apparition being seen, footsteps ascending and descending the tower stairs, and giggling has also been heard. Yeah, you hear giggling and there's cold spots, therefore haunted, for sure haunted. And the smell of burnt tobacco has also been whopping through the air many a times. Lighthouses are pretty stressful, more than fair. When paranormal investigators, specifically the Southeast Michigan Paranormal Society team, when they had a two day intensive investigation after their search, they concluded that they believe that there's every reason for the lighthouse to be haunted. The investigators did some electric voice phenomenon work in the living room, and then they heard loud thuds from overheard. Like where do they get this gear from, you know? Like I, I want this gear, I have some questions of myself going on in the apartment, I wanna swing it around a bit. A sound of something scraping along the floor as well, and additionally, during their investigation, the rocking chair had moved two feet and was still moving. Just love to keep rocking around. We love that. We love haunted rocking chairs. We love unexplainable forces. While they were upstairs, they also reported hearing heavy footsteps from another unknown source. So many ghosts, there's rocking chairs, people moving around, working in the basement. It doesn't sound like the afterlife is a peaceful one, if I'm being honest. Sounds like there's a lot of to do after you die. I'm not really looking forward to it. I thought I could just kind of float around near paintings, but now it sounds like I'm gonna have to go and wear this. Wear my morning clothes, who knows? Kicking us off at number five, we have the St. Louis Cemetery, number one. The first of three Roman Catholic cemeteries in New Orleans, this is a legendary site for ghost spotting. Although, you'll need a vetted tour guide to get in. Break this rule and who knows what kind of curse you'll incur. The cemetery is full of above ground tombs, which some refer to as cities of the dead. These vaults are largely from the 18th and 19th centuries, although some of the graves date back to early 1700s. Of course, with all sorts of above ground burials, one would expect to see plenty of ghosts here. Visitors claim to see manifestations of ghosts walking around and an abundance of amateur photographers claim to have captured ghost orbs on film. Digital too. Some ghosts are more famous than others, but at the St. Louis Cemetery number one, none are as well renowned as Mary Laveau. The voodoo queen of New Orleans, Laveau made a name for herself through fortune telling, occult studies, and herbal medicines. These days, gawkers claim to see her floating through the cemetery where she's buried wearing her signature bright colored clothing and white turban. Guests have reported being scratched, pinched, shoved, or even coming down with sudden unexplainable illnesses after seeing her ghost. For many years, followers of the occult would visit her tomb and mark it with three X's, but this led to more severe vandalism and it has been refurbished since. Lavo isn't the only ghost to roam the graves, but she is definitely the most well known. Just watch your back if you choose to visit and stick with the tour guide. Next up at number four, the Hanging Jail. The Gothic Jail of De Ritter was built in 1915. Anything gothic has a higher chance of being haunted, it's just how architecture works. That's why the Notre Dame is so full of ghosts. That and the whole Cloud Frollo situation. Spirit appreciators in the know believe that the jail is haunted by two men hung for the slaying of a taxi driver. Joe Genna and Moulton Brasso hired a taxi driver late one night and told him to drive. For reasons still up in the air, they killed him. 
Not knowing what to do with the body, the two men dumped it in the old Pickering Mill pond and ran off into the night. Maybe they drove off. I wonder if they took the cab. The body was found and traced back to the two would be on the run murderers, and such they were convicted and then hung from the third floor gallows. The interesting thing about the gallows, though, is that a spiral staircase circles around the noose. So there's a vertigo inducing set of stairs surrounding the ominously hanging noose. Definitely a ghost creator if I've ever seen one. In addition to this lovely feature, there's also an underground tunnel connecting the jail to the next door courthouse. That is a tunnel you would not want to find yourself in after hours. Who knows what kind of crooked necked wailing ghosts you find down there. Of course, there are plenty of people who claim to have captured photos of the ill fated duo along with many other unlucky lawbreakers. Just remember kids, if you want to be a ghost, constantly do things that you'll regret. That way, you'll have all sorts of reasons to stick around for the afterlife. Number 3. The Old State Penitentiary, 1885 the Old State is located 15 miles south of central Santa Fe and is an active men's maximum security prison that was built in 1885. Acting as a prison system for the US, the prison saw three massive riots in its entirety including 1922, 1953 and the worst and most bloody riot of all. 1980. One of the worst prison riots in American history. It's presumed to be the reason behind its haunting reputation. On February 2nd, 1980, several inmates initiated a riot which led to the inmates gaining control over the prison for a full day and a half. Unfortunately at the time, post 70s, the prison was overcrowded, underfunded, and riddled with untrained, fresh-faced security guards with the rampant need for excess bodies due to the overgrowing inmate count. After escaping and organizing this event, the cellmates then tortured 12 prison guards and brutally murdered 33 other inmates. These riots soon became medieval in nature, gruesome and truly evil. The most famous area for paranormal sightings can be heard and seen around cell block 4. Men here were brutally butchered, dismembered, decapitated, and some even hung up on the cells and burned alive. This section of the prison was closed in 1998 and is now referred to as Old Main. As if that history isn't dark enough, witnesses and researchers claim that there's a ton of spirits that roam this prison. Dark figures and ghostly shadows have been seen roaming the cells and halls, unexplainable slamming of cell doors, men's voices, strange noises, and even echoed screams can be heard at this location. This is why I don't even jaywalk people. Stay a couple nights at this haunted prison looking at axe marks on the ground? Yeah, no, I'm getting my phone out right away. I know exactly who I'm gonna call. Yeah. Number two, the Amador Hotel. Located at 251 West Amador Street at the corner of Water Street and Las Cruces, which translates to The Crosses, an area in New Mexico spanning as far back as the settled early 1800s, was thought to be an early mass gravesite for the amount of crosses present in the city. The Amador Hotel has stood serving the community in multiple ways over the years, including a courthouse, a post office, a bank, hotel, and even a county office center. Uh, yeah, can I get uh, two stamps, please? Thanks. Built in 1870, the Amador Hotel is a popular Las Cruces ghost tour and some of the rooms were even used as jail cells. Hey, you're grounded for 15 years to life, I don't know. The courthouse was completed in 1885. Amador added another story to the remaining structure and Amador Hall became a community center where people conversed in drinking and in storytelling. During tours, guests have reported seeing shadowy figures lurking in the hallways, numerous cold spots, flashlights turning on and off by themselves and having their arms even touched or scratched. Oh yeah, that's it. Just a little to the left. That's perfect. Some even say it's the work of a little ghost girl named Annie, who frequently visits the room on the second floor, giggling. Like giggling is great and all until like a 200 year old spirit giggles right in your face. Like what is still funny? This is terrifying. Joke must have been that good. Little ghost girls? Yeah, that's the scariest ghosts imaginable. 100%. The Amador Hotel ghost tour starts at 8pm and during a visit through the tour of the grounds, history and ghost hunting begins. I'm a strict matinee ghost hunter myself, only during the day. Or never. Or like around brunch, that's like perfect, nice and sunny. And coming in at number one, Double Eagle Restaurant. If you're heading down to Mesilla, New Mexico this weekend and enjoy burgers and ghost stories, well, then the Double Eagle Restaurant is a must stop for you. Known not only for the world's largest green pepper chili burger, this blast from the past decorated head to toe in its luxurious upscale Victorian decor is now the home to two prominent and active restaurants, the Double Eagle and Pepper's Cafe. 
All right, here we go. Let's dive in. Possibly the world's most haunted restaurants, originally owned by the Mays family, owning one of the leading and most lucrative import export businesses in Santa Fe, was Senor and Senora Mays. Senora Mays expected only the best for her eldest son, Armando. Mothers and their sons, right? Always imaginarily wiping something off their faces. Come here, come, just, there's more. There is grim history here, involving two forbidden star crossed lovers and a pair of sewing scissors. Reep, reep. Thank you. The Double Eagle restaurant is not only home for great food, beautifully handcrafted cocktails, but also home to a double homicide gruesome murder in which these victims' souls would seem to be trapped within these walls forever. Armando, son and heir to his parents' business, falling head over heels in love with the family's household servant named Enos. Although Enos reciprocated such feelings about Armando, their relationship had to remain a secret due to Armando's mother's strict ordinance and the difference in the teenager's social and political positions. When Sonora Mays discovered this relationship, she demanded that it end at once and banished Enos from her home indefinitely. It is said that one day Sonora Mays came home, and unexpectedly interrupting the lovers, mid-swoon, entranced by their love as she grabbed her sewing scissors from the basket on the patio and attacked Enos, stabbing and killing her. As she prepared to strike again, Armando, her son, threw his body in front of Enos and was stabbed instead. Yeah, that's some Romeo and Juliet stuff there, people. The murders were held in the famous Carlotta Salon Room, which can be visited at any time. A heavily requested stop where spooky goers can see a newspaper article titled Young Lover Ghosts on display, as well as an array of pictures taken of the young ghost lovers together over the years. That's terrifying. Here's the room. Here's what happened. Here's some proof. That's all I need to know, I've made my mind up. For never was a story of more woe than this of Enos and her Armando. And I tried to end on somewhat of a happy note. Love lasts forever and that's what I'm taking from this. Coming in at number five, we have Hotel Park Central. Located on Central Avenue in Albuquerque, you'll find Hotel Park Central. The original building was constructed in 1924 and served as a hospital. It was then purchased in the 1980s and transformed into a mental health hospital. However, in 2010, a major renovation occurred with a $21 million investment and it became the luxury hotel that we know today. The hauntings in this building date back to the time it served as a hospital. Patients would report seeing apparitions, hearing voices, seeing objects move and feeling the presence of other beings when nobody was there. As well, when it was a mental hospital, it was known by patients and workers that on the top floor on the right wing, there is a ghost of a woman that likes to watch people in the hallways. Patients also reported having their bedsheets pulled off them in the middle of the night. Patients were not the only ones to experience things that couldn't be explained though. Staff of the hospital did too. They would often have the sensation of being watched as well as hearing something whisper in their ear. The movement of objects and a general sense of heaviness throughout the buildings. Today many guests at the hotel report similar paranormal experiences as many guests report feeling watched in the presence of unseen beings. They have also reported hearing voices and shuffling in the stairwells. Several guests have also seen a female apparition on the third floor wing. A group of paranormal investigators was brought onto the scene of the hotel. The investigators were three team members who all experienced unexplained voices and whispering while close to the hotel. They also reported distinct coolness near their bodies and a sense of being watched. After reviewing their evidence, some of these experiences were captured on digital voice recorders. They also carried out the flashlight technique, an attempt at communication with the spirit that involves the answering of questions through the turning on and off of the flashlight. This was a success with several responses captured on video. In at number 4 we have the St. James Hotel. Built in 1972 by Henry Lambert, the St. James Hotel was established. Found in Cimarron, New Mexico, the hotel is known to be one of the most haunted places in America. The St. James Hotel is said to remain host to several restless spirits. Both the owners and the hotel guests will tell you that many unexplained events haunt it. Several psychics have visited the hotel and specifically identified three spirits and many others who passed through to relive their experiences. The hotel's second floor is the most active, with stories of cold spots and the smell of cigar smoke lingering in the halls. A prior manager commented about the spirits that linger in the hotel and said, you never see them but you do feel and hear them. Another report from a former owner states that she walked into the dining room and saw a pleasant looking cowboy standing behind her in the mirror on the front of the bar. The spiritual activity of the hotel has been featured on the popular television show 
unsolved mysteries and a current affair. Room 18 at the hotel is kept locked because it houses the ghost of an ill-tempered Thomas James Wright who lost his life at his door just after winning the rights to the hotel in a poker game. Having been injured from behind, Wright continued into the room and slowly met the end of his life. Because of the tragic accident that happened in room 18, it is known as one of the scariest and most haunted rooms. This can be seen with one former owner who said she was pushed down while in the room and on another occasion saw a ball of angry orange light floating in the upper corner. The staff considers the room to be the most haunted and people are rarely allowed to enter this room, much less sleep in it. Rumours abound that when the room was rented, several mysterious deaths occurred there. Other unknown entities are also said to roam the hotel, creating a host of paranormal activities. Staff report that items constantly fall off walls and shelves and electrical equipment at the front desk behaves unpredictably. Others have reported cold spots throughout the historic inn, lights that seemingly turn on by themselves, feelings of being watched by unseen eyes, and cameras that cease to work inside the hotel, strangely returning to normal after leaving St. James. Coming in at number 3, we have the Dauphine Orleans Hotel. What was once a bordello is now a very popular hotel and bar. Jilted lovers, recovering soldiers, mistreated women, they all have a chance to haunt this New Orleans landmark. Of all the stories, there are four that tend to come up no matter who you ask. The first is that of a lost bride, thought to be the spirit of a young woman named Millie. She was working for the bar as a courtesan when she met a dapper young man and they decided to get married. However, on the morning of the wedding, Millie's groom-to-be was shot dead in a gambling dispute. Distraught, Millie waited for days for her fiancé to show up and never took her wedding dress off. For years, she would wear the white dress around the bar, hoping that someday he would show up. Now her ghost wanders the hotel in her dress, waiting for her love. Another classic story is that of the dancing girl. A young teen has been seen dancing around in the ballroom. Many a drunk guest has claimed that a young girl helped them to their room, all the while dancing as if she were floating on air. There's also the tale of the rebel, a ghost dressed in a dark confederate uniform. While no battles took place in New Orleans, plenty of wounded soldiers would end up in the city for rest and recovery, and maybe a little bit of time at the bordello. This ghost has been seen pacing the outer courtyard, earning the nickname the Worried General. And of of course, the bar itself, known as May's Place, is full to the brim with ghosts. Employees claim to have seen all sorts of unexplainable stuff, from glasses falling down from high shelves, to locked doors opening up on their own, to brochures swirling around like fall leaves. If you're looking for a haunted overnight stay, the Dauphine Orleans is probably your best bet. Don't go paying any of the ghosts for services though, you probably won't get what you're expecting. Coming in at number 2, Myrtle's Plantation. Built in the late 1700s, this is considered by some to be one of America's most haunted homes. Made extra legendary by the multiple photographs taken featuring ghosts, you'd be hard pressed to find an ectoplasm enthusiast who hasn't heard of young Chloe. Chloe was a young slave punished for eavesdropping on the family. She took her revenge later on in the form of a poisoned birthday cake. It was served up to the owners of the house and within 3 hours, 3 people were dead. Apparently that wasn't enough revenge for one lifetime though, as Chloe is still said to haunt the plantation. Two different pictures have been taken with apparent ghostly qualities to them. One is a photo of the facade of the house, and if you look carefully in the corner, a ghostly visage can be seen. Another is of two tourists taking a selfie in front of a window, and Chloe can be seen peering out from in front of the curtains. While famous, some folks claim that they could be doctors. What do you think? After the Chloe incident, many later owners suffered death and murder tragedies while living at the house. Their ghosts have also been seen roaming the grounds. These days, most of the scary stuff is directly ghost related, so I don't know if it's still dangerous or just a spooky tourist attraction. Maybe the spirits like the attention they're getting from the public and would rather not kill anyone else. And finally at number one, the LaLaurie Mansion. Back in the 1830s, the LaLaurie family was extremely well to do, especially Delphine LaLaurie. She was a well respected member of society and known for throwing lavish parties. All was well and everyone had their fun until disaster struck. A fire swept through the building burning much of it to the ground. Among the rubble, firefighters found the bodies of chained and tortured slaves in a hidden chamber. It appears that Delphine would perform unnecessary surgery on these poor helpless folks too. By the time all this was figured out, the LaLauries had fled the country, never to be seen again. With no way for justice to be served, the souls of the people held here 
remained looking for revenge. Pretty much all future owners of the property quickly left after moving in. The ghosts haunting the walls are pretty aggressive too, with many people reporting bizarre physical assaults by forces unseen. Today, ghost hunters say that it's the most haunted house in the French Quarter. Historians dispute this, but that's not going to stop the Phantom fans from traveling to the haunted mansion. Number 5 in this list is the Thunderbird Youth Academy. The Thunderbird Youth Academy is located in Pryor and is deeply haunted with the ghosts of students who have long passed. Back in 1942, it suffered a horrible tragedy where a lot of the children staying here passed away. Back then it was an orphanage and it was still years before it would become a military school. It got hit hard with a devastating tornado that the building simply wasn't ready for. Tons of the children who lived there perished due to the storm and now their ghosts are set to linger here. Stories where people will wake up in their beds and find literally other children lying in them staring directly at them are far too common. These stories also don't even factor in one of the most famous ghosts there, Hector. Hector is a young boy who haunts the third platoon building. Hector's story is far more graphic than the other children who died. It's not confirmed, but some say that the cook took Hector's life and did it in a fashion that I can't go into detail on YouTube about. Either way, now his spirit forever haunts this building and all of those who reside in it. I personally would never want to go to military school anyways as a kid, but having it be haunted would make it even worse. Number 4 on this list is the Tulsa Theater. It's weird how some places attract ghosts and spirits more than others. Theaters are one of the most prominent spots for paranormal presences and this theater is no exception. News Oklahoma says, Tulsa Theater, formerly known as Brady Theater, used to be a vaudeville house providing entertainment to audiences. This space went through a lot over the years, including being abandoned and almost destroyed. But after renovations and a name change, the Tulsa Theater reopened. Legend is, the space is haunted by an Italian opera singer named Enrico Caruso. Caruso took in the sights around town while in Tulsa to perform. He wanted to see the oil wells and how they made them, said French. And as they came back, it was raining, it was cold, miserable, and the car broke down. Despite already being sick, Caruso made the journey back on foot in the rain to give what turned out to be his last performance ever. He had a great performance according to history, French said. It was one of his best, standing ovations in the whole nine yards. Unfortunately, after returning to Italy, Caruso died. French said many say Tulsa caused Caruso's demise and that's why it's believed he haunts the theater. Even Caruso's manager named Tulsa as the reason for his death. But it goes deeper than just Caruso. When it was the Brady Theater, the building is rumored to have played a role in the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. I mean, it played a huge role. It housed some of the victims. There are rumors they died inside and some other horrible things that happened to them, French said. We actually captured electronic video phenomena evidence that almost confirms all of the stories there. The Tulsa Race Massacre was a horrible display of hate and racism. On May 31st in 1921, a bunch of white residents who had been given weapons by city officials attacked a bunch of black residents. This incident lasted over 24 hours and saw more than 800 people get injured and at least 36 people die. A horrifying tragedy that never should have occurred. It's no wonder that any place tied to this incident could be haunted. Coming in at number 3 we have Van Dusen Mansion. In 1892, great in 1892, Grain Baron George Van Dusen built a monumental mansion for his family. With 12,000 square feet, 10 fireplaces, a turret, and a $45,000 price tag, the home was a symbol of turn of the century prosperity. After two generations of Van Dusens moved out in 1937, the building had been used to house almost everything except a family since, being used as a school, training medical facility, and even a college throughout the years. It was vacant in the late 1930s and spent 20 years as the college of commerce. It was home to Hamline University Law School, then the Horst International Education Center. In the late 1980s, the castle fell on hard times and became little more than a flop house. By the early 90s, it was headed for the wrecking ball. Two weeks before it was scheduled to be demolished, it was rescued by Wisconsin entrepreneur Bob Poling, who bought it for $237,000. Now a venue to hold fairy tale esque weddings, the Van Dusen Mansion has had its fair share of past lives. 
In at number 2 we have Mounds Theatre. The renovated theatre and 86 year old movie house can be found in Minnesota. The old theatres have been rumoured for the past several years to be a home of community of creepy ghosts. One story goes as the Mounds was built in 1922 and operated as a movie house until 1967. When it closed so abruptly that when volunteers arrived many years later to renovate the place they found popcorn on the floor. The subject of paranormal TV shows and professional ghost hunting investigations, the theatre is allegedly haunted by a trio of ghosts, a happy little girl who bounces a ball on stage, a cursed old man that who lurks in the shadowy corners of the projection booth, and a crestfallen usher who walks up and down the aisles in search of his lost love. The ghosts in the theatres are so active that the owner had a party of four ghostbusters in a projection room sit in one dark and stormy October night. The dim light was extinguished and the room grew chilled. The owner stated that as the four sat silently awaiting their fate, shivering in the dark, and all at once there was the sound of a man crying. When investigating the sounds of the crying man, they found a shadow figure in the corner of the room. The figure reported having black glittering eyes and an aura of anger. Because of the odd ghost encounter and negative energy, they had to abruptly end the ghost investigation before it was too late. Another former owner who reopened the theatre in 2001 claims that the spirits of the theatre have gone physical and grabbed them while they were working late at night. Some paranormal investigators have left with claw marks on their backs, but the scariest ghost of them all is considered the young girl. This is the theatre's most notorious ghost and is seen in a pink dress often bouncing a ball on the stage. And finally in the number one we have Anoka State Hospital. Located in Anoka town is the Anoka State Hospital which is arguably the most haunted place in Minnesota. The Anoka Hospital was the first state asylum for individuals that were deemed insane. The building was established in 1898 and opened in 1900 to admit patients from other state asylums that had become too crowded. The first 100 patients were males from St. Peter's State Hospital and were considered to be chronic incurables, men who had lost their minds due to heredity, causes or environment. In 1906, 115 women were also transferred to the asylum from St. Peter State Hospital. Residents were not to receive any type of treatment at this asylum, as this was the final stop for them until they passed away. And passed they did. A total of 86 of the original patients were buried in numbered graves in the asylum cemetery. The original name of the institution was Anoka State Asylum, but in an attempt to soften the image, they changed its name in 1937 to the Anoka State Hospital. Although the name was kinder and gentler, treatment at the facility was not. Patients were subjected to medical experiments and suffered both mental and physical harm. The original hospital complex closed in 1999 and residents were transferred to a new facility located close by. The buildings and property were then given to Anoka County to use for offices and to house the county workhouse. The remainder of the buildings were closed and boarded up. With such a terrifying past, it is no wonder that the Anoka State Hospital has been rumored to house the spirits of past patients. Former employees have reported that while unusual occurrences happen throughout the buildings, the most paranormal activities are linked to the tunnels located below the buildings. These tunnels were used as a way of transferring patients from one building to another without risking escape. Ironically, many patients believed these tunnels would lead them to freedom and so they tried to escape by going down into them, but after a few twists and turns, escapees realized that the tunnels were more of a maze than an escape route. Without an understanding of where each tunnel went and how they joined together, it was easy to get hopelessly lost in them. Several escapees became so disorientated and distraught that they took the only way out that they felt was left to them and ended their lives. For years employees would report hearing footsteps trudging through the tunnels, stopping, pausing. There was also reports of whispering and low voices in conversation but the words were not understood. The paranormal activities became so rampant that most employees refused to use the tunnels because they were just too eerie. Today only maintenance and security are allowed in them. Today the county owns the buildings that made up the former insane asylum complex. Although the complex was eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, it appears that that time has passed. The current buildings are in a state of extreme disrepair. Number 5. Area 51, Nevada Starting out our list, we have the most obvious entry. In the American state of Nevada, you will find no shortage of places to go on vacation. Despite being a desert, you will find locations like the Hoover Dam, Red Rock Canyon, and of course, the various casinos and attractions in Las Vegas. Of course, a location that you will not find yourself getting into is the military base located on the Salt Flats of Groom Lake, which is colloquially known 
as Area 51. For years, Area 51 has been the subject of conspiracy theories involving everything from government testing to UFO activity. Adding to its mystique is the fact that the US government wouldn't even officially acknowledge that it existed until 2013. Its official use is apparently the testing of experimental aircraft, but the level of security at the base is extremely high, even for a government base. Employees of Area 51 are flown in on a private airline, known as Janet Airlines, with Janet being an acronym that stands for just another non-existent terminal. Some former employees have reported getting paid through private companies that they have no involvement with in order to avoid a paper trail, linking them to the base. Some theories about the purpose of Area 51 include it being used to develop energy weapons for the Strategic Defense Initiative, to develop time travel technology, and most infamously, for studying, storing, and reverse engineering the remains of crashed alien ships, including those that were found at the Roswell crash site. As it is a closed off and secret government facility, tourists are of course not allowed to get into the site, with signs around the perimeter promising prosecution and possibly even deadly force against trespassers. Of course, this hasn't stopped alien enthusiasts from making the journey to Nevada to see the number of Area 51 and alien adjacent attractions, such as bus tours of the extraterrestrial highway, the black mailbox, and the outskirts of this secret government facility. Number 4. The Princess Theatre, Alberta In the Canadian city of Edmonton, Alberta, there is no shortage of movie theaters, with multiple malls housing multiple multiplexes, enabling local cinema lovers to watch the latest in entertainment. However, for many years, the crown jewel for movie lovers in Edmonton was not the Cineplex in West Edmonton Mall, or even the Garneau Theatre, which shows independent and classic films. No. For many years, the most classic of the theaters was the Princess Theatre on White Avenue. Built in 1914 for then staggering $75,000, this three-story single-screen theatre would show moving pictures, concerts, and vaudeville acts while also having a basement billiards parlour for those not interested in the shows. The theatre was known for implementing extremely novel and modern elements, such as a fireproof projection room, an electric time projection clock, an electronic ticketing machine, forced air ventilation, and even refrigerated fountain beverages. The theatre was soon drawn into economic hardship and was forced to construct rental apartments on the upper and lower floors. One of these apartment renters was soon met with a tragic and disturbing end. According to local legend, an engaged woman lived in one of the upper apartments, but mere days before she was due to be wed, she was scorned by her fiancé. She was found hanging from the rafters while dressed in her wedding dress. In the years that followed, employees and patrons of the princess reported seeing a ghostly woman wearing a white dress who would suddenly appear and disappear, ascending the theater's grand staircase, wandering its ornate gold-leafed halls, or even hovering over the projection room. The princess was a staple for local cinema lovers, as well as fans of the paranormal for decades. But if you were interested in taking in a show or catching a glimpse of the ghostly bride, you may have missed your window, as the theater closed its doors after 108 years of operation in mid-2022. No new owners or plans for the historical theater have been announced, and the doors remain locked to the public, with only the ghosts still residing inside of this historic building. In at number 3 we have Bobby Spring Ranch. Located just outside the glitz of the Las Vegas Strip sits a plot of land that takes visitors to another time and place. That land is known as the haunted Bonnie Springs Ranch. Originally built in 1843, the ranch was used as a stopover for the wagon trains going to California. While in 1958 the ranch was renovated and opened to the public as a tourist attraction with stables, a restaurant and a pet Zoo. Later, a functioning saloon, shops, wax museum, wedding chapel, and replica schoolhouse were added to the ranch. There is not only one ghost that roams the ranch, as it's known there are multiple spirits that reside at the Bobby Springs. But one of Bonnie Spring Ranch's most commonly cited ghosts is that of a little girl. Her spirit is mostly cited playing in and around the town schoolhouse before suddenly disappearing. The nearby merry-go-round has also been known to turn on its own unexplainably, where many believe it could be the spirit of the little girl playing on the ride. Another active area of Bonnie Springs Ranch for paranormal activity is the Wax Figure Museum. This small tunnel like maze leads guests through a creepy history display, which literally comes to life for some. Many have claimed to witness these wax figurines move on their own and appear as though they are inhaling breath. The ranch's management even had to allegedly nail the displays down as they were moving out of position so frequently. The final and most evil of Bonnie Springs Ranch's hauntings are found within the Opera House. It is here that a darker, more negative energy is present 
present. The spirit takes the form of a dark shadow figure that follows people through the area and has even been captured in photographs, disturbing the EVPs have also been caught in this area. In at number 2 we have Nevada's Governor's Mansion. From the outside the Nevada State Governor's Mansion is a grand two story building. While inside on the first floor you will find the grand entry hall, the reception room and the formal dining room. Though don't let its appearance fool you as there are spirits haunting its grounds. The Governor's Mansion was completed in 1909 and the Governor Denver S. Dickerson was the first governor to occupy the residence. His daughter June is the first and only child ever born in the Governor's Mansion. The mansion is said to be haunted by June and her mother Una. Since their passing in the mansion there has continually been paranormal activity reports in the household. The mansion is said to be haunted because former employees at the mansion have reported hearing cold wind blowing from an antique grandfather clock that also swings open periodically without assistance. Former first lady Sandy Miller's brother in law is said to have seen the apparition of a woman in a white gown. The woman is believed to be Una Dickerson dressed for the mansion's opening in 1909. And finally in at number 1 we have Silver Queen Hotel. Located in Virginia City, Nevada, the Silver Queen Hotel was constructed in 1876. This makes it the oldest hotel in Virginia City. However, the Silver Queen Hotel is known for much more than just being the oldest hotel in Nevada. The main level of the property features an authentic 1870s saloon with one of the largest single piece wooden bar counters and bar backs you'll ever see. The Silver Queen is also a popular destination for weddings as there is a historic chapel on site. Of all of the allegedly haunted places in Nevada, paranormal experts tend to agree that Virginia City as an entire city is the most collectively haunted place in Nevada, especially as staff guests and countless paranormal investigators are certain that ghosts roam the 138 year old property. One of the most active spirits that haunt the hotel is Rosie. Rosie was an adult entertainment worker who dealt business in the Silver Queens. Though during the late 1800s in room 11 Rosie lost her life. Her story remains mysterious but Rosie is said to have never left the Silver Queen, making countless appearances in the decades following her passing. Even though the entire hotel is carpeted, guests have often reported loud steps on a wooden floor, rattling doorknobs the sound of voices or even the sight of Rosie herself at the top of a long staircase where she has been spotted lingering. Other visitors report on TripAdvisor and Yelp describing the loud noises at night and an unexplainable sense of eeriness. One guest had a more terrifying encounter in the hotel as they described getting chased down the hallway in the middle of the night by a ghost. At lucky number 5 is Joliet Correctional Center. The Joliet Correctional Center, established in Joliet, Illinois in 1858, holds a storied past that is as captivating as it is haunting. This historic penitentiary served as a house of horrors for over 150 years, housing some of the state's most notorious criminals. Within its imposing stone walls lie a rich history of many eerie and disturbing tales. But the most chilling of these tales is that of the murder of the warden's wife in 1915. Odette Allen, better known simply as the warden's wife, was an aspiring singer before marrying her husband, Warden Ned Allen. The marriage would have her move from her home in Los Angeles to living in the Joliet Correct Center with her betrothed. Odette was incredibly popular among the inmates. She was known to be a kind and compassionate woman who tried to make the lives of the prisoners a little more bearable by offering them small acts of kindness, such as providing treats or lending a listening ear to their troubles. The inmates would call her things like the good angel and the little mother at the big stir. Out of admiration for her benevolence, the inmates would often act as servants to her and the warden as an alternative to hard prison labor. In June of 1915, the warden went to Chicago to meet with Paul politicians about the building of a new prison. Adette didn't join her husband because the dresses she wanted to wear weren't yet ready. One morning, Adette asked for the help of Joe Campbell, also known as Chicken Joe, a prisoner who had been convicted of murder at the age of 29. He was selected to be Adette's personal servant because of his great behavior and his healthy relationship with her and the warden. He was due for parole the next week and Adette was going to testify for him at his hearing. Sounds like life was looking up for Chicken Joe, but what happened next would tragically bring all these good things to ruin for the young prisoner. The morning of her death, Odette asked Joe to refill her water bottle, go grab her coffee and a newspaper, and to walk her dog. To this, Joe obliged, but then an hour later he would return to the house with smoke coming from Odette's bedroom window. Firefighters were quick to the scene, but were not fast enough, as once they extinguished the flames, Odette's charred body was already laying still on the bed. Upon investigation, they discovered that Odette was SA'd and killed before the bed was set on fire, and suspicions immediately turned to Chicken Joe. Joe was the subject of much scrutiny from police, Illinois citizens, and even fellow prisoners. Even after adamantly 
pleading innocence, Joe was sentenced to death by the court. But his sentence was changed to life in prison at the last second by a sympathetic governor who believed his story. After the tragedy, strange things started happening in the prison. Many inmates and guards would report seeing or hearing Odette still wandering the halls. There have also been some cases of hearing her singing in the nearby prison cemetery. One night in the 1930s, about 5,000 people went to the cemetery armed in an attempt to vanquish the apparition. But no one could find her anywhere. Amidst the chaos, a dozen people went missing, supposed victims of the ghost. Which to me is crazy. Like, at what point are you so scared of a ghost, you need 5,000 people just to get rid of it? And they still didn't even find her. Just give up at that point, guys, come on. Anyway, it is said that Odette remains in the prison in order to protect her boys, the prisoners who were inspired by her kindness and honored her after death through their good behavior. Any visitor that would try to disturb her peace would incur the poltergeist's wrath and suddenly disappear. If you were to visit the prison today, which closed in 2002 and was turned into a historical site, there's still a good chance you might come across Adette's ghost, still wandering and singing. Next up at number 4 is the Congress Plaza Hotel. Constructed in 1893 as part of the World's Columbian Exposition, the Congress Plaza Hotel has welcomed countless guests over the years, including prominent figures such as presidents, celebrities, and even infamous gangsters. Its iconic location overlooking Grant Park and Lake Michigan has made it a popular choice for visitors seeking a taste of vintage luxury. But it is the hotel's dark past and ghostly residents that have set it truly apart. One of the most well-known ghosts said to haunt the hotel is that of a ghostly presence known as the Shadow Man. His story dates back to 1900, when Captain Louis Ostheim, a war veteran haunted by the horrors of the Spanish-American War, sought refuge at the hotel on the eve of his wedding. The captain would often experience PTSD-induced night terrors and suffer from extreme anxiety and paranoia. The night of his death, he awoke suddenly after being consumed by a brutal episode. In his disoriented state, he would search for solace or an escape from his inner demons. And tragically, he took his own life. Ever since that fateful night, the spirit of Captain Ostheim has been seen walking through the Congress Plaza Hotel, appearing as a shadowy figure gliding through the halls with a haunting aura. Guests and staff have reported encountering the Shadow Man on multiple occasions, his spectral form silently following their footsteps as if seeking some elusive connection or unfinished business. Those unlucky enough to meet the Shadow Man's gaze would begin feeling greatly distressed and having night terrors of their own, some meeting the same fate as him after the fact. As the years have passed, the legend of the Shadow Man has become deeply ingrained in the history of the Congress Plaza Hotel, adding to its reputation as one of Illinois' most haunted locations. The spirit's enigmatic presence, coupled with the tragic circumstances that led to his lingering existence, makes encounters with the Shadow Man as eerie and thought-provoking as they are dangerous. Do any of you guys see any ghosts while staying in a hotel? Leave a comment, because I feel like these days every hotel on the planet is haunted. In at number 3 we have Kaimo Theatre. Built in 1927, this grand palace of a theatre certainly is a masterpiece of Pablo Deco fused with Art Deco. The creation of this beautiful southwestern style theatre was financed by a hardworking wealthy entrepreneur, Orest Bacecchi, who wanted to fulfil a lifelong dream of building a grand theatre which would rival other larger than life movie palaces that were springing up around the United States. A large fire in 1963 destroyed Kaimo Theatre's iconic stage and much of the building, prompting the Bacecchi family to demolish it. In 1977, the same year, the theatre was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The citizens of Albuquerque voted to purchase Kaimo Theatre at a steep discount. In return, the city of Albuquerque offered to fund the restoration of the landmark attraction. With the change of hands, local restoration experts were hired to restore Kaimo Theatre to its former glory. The hauntings of Kaimo Theatre can be traced back to a freak accident that happened in the late afternoon on August 2nd, 1951. Back then, hundreds of moviegoers were in Kaimo Theatre to catch the latest films. Without warning, a water heat located in the theatre's lobby exploded, sending scalding hot steam and plaster into the air. A total of eight people were injured in the accident, including one person losing their life, Bobby Darnell. Since then, the theatre is said to be haunted by the ghost of Bobby. Performers and staff of Kaimo Theatre have all reported strange and unexplainable activities happening in the theatre. In particular, donuts placed backstage for performers would often go missing. To appease the spirit of Bobby, an altar was erected beneath the stairs to the dressing rooms. Toys, sweets and donuts would be placed before every major performance to ensure the success of each show. Those who didn't would face a disastrous performance. Kaimo Theatre's technical manager Dennis Potter recounted an incident in December 1986 when the donuts were removed by Andrew Shear, director of A Christmas Carol, just minutes before the first show. It did not take long before the disaster occurred. Electrical cables fell, lights exploded, doors on the set opened without warning, and performers
consumers had forgotten their lines. After the end of the disastrous show, the donuts were promptly replaced and the next show went off without a hiccup. However, an interview with Andrew contradicted the Potter's story, with the former claiming that the donuts were never removed or replaced. Apart from the unexplainable disruption, staff working at Kaimo Theatre have also reported seeing the ghost of Bobby, dressed in a striped shirt and blue pants. The ghost of Bobby is often seen loitering on the lobby staircase, looking for the next victim of his harmless shenanigans. In at number 2 we have La Fonda Hotel. Standing in Santa Fe, New Mexico, there is the historic La Fonda Hotel. Over the years the hotel was destroyed and rebuilt several times over. In 1821, when Captain William Becknell blazed the path of what would become known as the Santa Fe Trail, he stayed at a La Fonda, where the trail terminated at the town central plaza. As more and more pioneers travelled the Santa Fe Trail, the La Fonda became a popular destination for trappers, traders, mountain men, soldiers, politicians and the like. The current La Fonda was built in 1922 on the site of the previous inns. In 1925, it was acquired by the Atchison Topeka Santa Fe Railroad, which leased it to Fred Harvey. For more than 40 years, from 1926 to 1968, La Fonda was one of the famous Harvey Houses, a renowned chain of fine hotels. Today, the La Fonda Hotel is said to host not only travellers visiting Santa Fe, but also several ghosts. Some people believe that the Honourable Judge Slough continues to walk its hallways. However, more often reported is the ghost of the distraught salesman who jumped into the well after losing all of his company's money. The hotel's dining room called the La Plazuela is situated directly over the old well and both guests and staff alike have reported the sight of a ghostly figure that walks to the centre of the room, then seemingly jumps into the floor and disappears. Other reported phenomena include a ghost that haunts the Santa Fe room, as well as a spirit that walks the hallways near the La Terraza, a restaurant located on the east side of the hotel's third floor. In the 1970s, a ghost reportedly called the front desk to complain that someone was walking up and down the hallway in front of his room. When an employee was sent to investigate, he saw a tall man in a long black coat disappear into a stairwell. However, when he followed him to the stairs, there was no sign of the mysterious visitor. And finally, in at number one, we have the Luna Mansion. The Luna Mansion in Los Lunas, New Mexico, is known for one thing, and it's its ghost stories. Over the years, the Luna Mansion in Los Lunas has gained a reputation as being haunted. Guests and staff alike have shared stories of unexplained activity, which some chalk up to the paranormal. Over the years, the mansion changed hands several times before it was purchased and renovated as a fine dining establishment in the 1970s. It was then that the ghost of Josephina began to appear. Perhaps she didn't like the renovations, or maybe she just wants to stick around to make sure they were doing a good job on the home that she had spent so many years looking after. Dressed in 1920s period clothing, she had been described by employees as appearing very real. Most often, she is seen in two former bedrooms on the second floor, an attic, storeroom, and at the top of the stairs leading to the second floor bar. At the top of the stairs sits an old rocking chair, which she has often been seen sitting in and rocking slowly. On one occasion, when an employee approached the ghost, she simply stood up and then slowly vanished. More often, she is seen walking up and down the stairs, a habit that has been so commonplace that employees barely notice anymore. Where there's one spirit, others seem to follow, and more ghostly apparitions have been seen at the mansion. One of these is a former servant named Cruz, who was thought to have been a groundskeeper. Most often seen on the main level, he is said to be particularly friendly to women and children and likes to play practical jokes on the employees and patrons. On one occasion, he was seen sitting on a sofa as if waiting to be served. Dressed in vintage attire, the man was relaxing patiently when a waitress asked another staff member why he hadn't been served. However, the response was, what man? And when the waitress looked back to the sofa, the vintage spirit faded away. Kicking off the list at number 5, the mission of San Miguel. 1610. The birthplace and historic site, the original San Miguel Church was most likely built shortly after the founding of Santa Fe in 1610, and is claimed to have been the first ever church built in America. Churches are already creaky and creepy, then this is the oldest one in the states? Okay, here we go. This church was built right across the Santa Fe River in the area referred to as the Barrio de Analco, which was inhabited mainly by the native population for the past thousand years. The San Miguel Mission was first mentioned in writing in 1628, indicating it was in use at that point as both a mission and a school. Although intended as a mission, the Spanish also used it as their parish church until the parroquia was completed. The original San Miguel Church was probably much smaller than the structure present, with more of a rectangular apse, a slight 
slightly raised sanctuary and a simple front elevation with no towers at all. The surviving foundations were excavated and closely researched by Bruce Ellis and Stanley Stubbs in 1955. Although the present building dates from 1710, it has undergone a multitude of significant structural changes since its infamous riot in which partially destroyed the building during the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. This was an uprising of mostly the indigenous Pueblo peoples against the Spanish colonizers in Santa Fe de Nuevo, Mexico. The Pueblo Revolt killed around 400 Spaniards and drove the remaining 2,000 settlers out of the province, which is where the creepy stuff kind of sits around. Since its construction, there have been over 300 years of ghostly apparitions seen at these ruins. You can never really pinpoint a specific person at this location, but there are numerous sightings that have been documented over the years, ranging from ghost horses, dragging sounds, and loud bangs resembling warfare. The San Miguel Chapel still stands after 400 years due to its local, national, and international community that has supported its preservation and history. Everybody chipping in. I love it. Little TLC. I bet you this is also where you see ghosts on different floors that used to be there or behind walls that don't even exist anymore. Like, are they bound by these structures forever? They're just like... Forever? Number four, La Posada Hotel. 1882. Located at 330 East Palace Avenue in Santa Fe, New Mexico, La Posada Hotel is more than 100 years old, finishing construction in 1884. A lively and prominent spot for celebrities in town during the 1900s, it was originally built to be the home of Mr. Abraham and Mrs. Julia Stab. Perfect last name for the start of something scary. Stab. A prominent businessman and a German immigrant, Abraham had constructed this beautiful Grand French Second Empire estate ready to make a life working with his brother Zodak in business and eventually settling down in this historic town with the mansion acting as a social hub for both the business and celebrity events. It is said that the Stabs have seven children, one of which died at birth and which in fact led Miss Stab to an oppressed self-exile state dying at the age of only 52. The mansion was converted into a hotel in 1936 shortly after the rubble of the depression had cleared and it is said that Julia herself haunts the rooms of La Posada Hotel. Guests have made claims to hear voices in vacant bedrooms, lights flickering on and off and even doors slamming in the middle of the night. Voices saying things like, I'm in here. It's never just like casual and calm like, oh yeah, yeah, just leave the door open, I'm in here, come on in. It's always a creepy whisper in here like, I'm in here. Too creepy. La Posada Hotel Resort and Spa still remains one of New Mexico's most haunted hotels and is active and encourages overnighters to check out the Julia Stab package, which involves a ghostly tour, history lesson of the grounds, a lovely dinner away from the kids, and a day done right by the pool or spa. Unfortunately, I won't be taking them up on the stab package at any time soon. Not at all. No chance. I hear one thing in the middle of the night and I'm out. And I'm up quickly. 12 seconds flat. I'm just like, Number three, Mount Weather Emergency Operations Center, Virginia. In a world that seems to constantly be on the brink of disaster, it is comforting to know that the US government has a safe location where the elite and powerful will be safe from destruction they most likely caused. Such is the purpose of the US Department of Homeland Security operated base located near Bluemont, Virginia. The Mount Weather Emergency Operations Center, otherwise known as the High Point Special Facility, has been in operation since the late 1800s when it was used as a simple weather station. In 1928, the observatory building became President Calvin Coolidge's summer White House before being used as a civilian public service facility where conscientious objectors could serve the government during World War II without having to go into conflict. In 1959, an underground facility was completed and designated Area B. The other buildings that were referred to as Area A became training facilities for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA. Around this time, it became a relocation center site for high-level civilian and military officials in the event of a national disaster, such as an attack or massive natural disaster. It plays a major role in many of the United States government's contingency plans for maintaining the continuity of government. It has a high-frequency radio system, which connects it to most federal public safety agencies, which allows the president to access and use the emergency alert system so that they can broadcast emergency alerts or warnings. An example of its use was on September 11th, 2001, when the majority of 
of congressional leadership were taken from Washington by helicopter and evacuated to Mount Weather. The National Art Gallery has also developed a program that would have the country's most valuable paintings helicoptered over to the facility in the event of an attack, in order to make sure important cultural pieces are preserved in the event of an attack that would otherwise destroy them. Obviously, this site is off limits to all but the most high level of people, and it is not open for tourists. But if you are nearby and see a large group of frantic looking officials arriving by helicopter, or you see a message on TV from the president being broadcast from this facility, be very afraid, as it means that something terrifying and horrible has or is about to occur. Number 2. Boblo Island Amusement Park, Ontario North America has no shortage of amusement parks for families and thrill seekers alike to visit. The Canadian province of Ontario has several to choose from, including Canada's Wonderland, Great Wolf Lodge, and Splashtown Niagara. One theme park that you won't be able to buy a ticket for, however, is the Boblo Island Amusement Park, located on the island of Bois Blanc, just above the mouth of the Detroit River. The park was opened in 1898 and used a ferry system to service guests from Ontario and Detroit and bring them to the island where they had a variety of attractions to keep them occupied and having fun. Some of these included the Falling Star, a log flume, a theater, a sky tower, a ferris wheel, a zoo, a carousel, and a dance hall financed by Henry Ford himself. It also had three roller coasters, the Screamer, the Nightmare, and the Sky Streak. It also had Boblo's scoot boats, which were essentially aquatic bumper cars. The park operated for many years before eventually closing down for financial reasons in late 1993. There are still ferries that operate in order to get island residents on and off the island, but the now abandoned amusement park has been declared off limits by the property owners. Of course, the dilapidated carousel building, dance pavilion, and sky tower have since proven to be too appealing for urban explorers to keep away from, and the eerie overgrown site still sees a variety of visitors. Like any good amusement park, it of course has a reputation for being haunted by a variety of ghosts. My personal favorite of the ghost stories is the story of Smiley the Magician. Back when the theater still operated and showed a variety of different performers, one of the most consistently booked performers of the 30s and 40s was a magician named Smiley Smilovich. Smiley was an old school magician who had trained with Houdini in the late 20s and was known for his seemingly death-defying tricks. One of his most famous tricks was a metamorphosis trick, where he would put a trunk on stage climb into it, lock it, and then have the trunk set on fire. He would escape through a trap door, the trunk would burn away, revealing that he had escaped, and the crowd would go wild. One day he was doing this trick as usual, but when he locked himself in the trunk, he had a heart attack and died. The trunk was set on fire, and the audience was left in terror as Smiley's body burned in front of them. Ever since then, Smiley's ghost would apparently haunt the theater, being sighted watching shows that were performed there, showing a special interest in magic shows. In the years since the park's closure, the occasional rumor of the magician being spotted has come up from the various urban explorers checking out the overgrown buildings. Would you ever be brave enough to explore Boblo Island Amusement Park? And if you did, would you be on the lookout for spectral magicians? Number 1. North Brother Island, New York The North Brother Island is one of two small islands located in the East River of New York City. The island remained uninhabited until 1885, with the only trace of humanity being a small lighthouse that was erected in 1869. The island began seeing more use in 1885 when the Riverside Smallpox Hospital moved from Roosevelt Island to North Brother, when their mission expanded to treating and isolating victims of other quarantinable diseases such as typhoid, tuberculosis, and especially polio. In 1904, a steamship called the General Slocum was set ablaze, and over a thousand people perished, either from the fire or from drowning while trying to escape, and ended up washing ashore on the island. One of the most famous residents at the hospital was Mary Mallon, otherwise known as Typhoid Mary, who was confined on the island for 20 years until her death in 1938, after having been declared a public health menace for infecting between 51 and 122 people while working as a cook. As public health Health measures like vaccines began to be adopted in the 30s and 40s, the need for a quarantine hospital lessened to the point where the hospital was closed. It was converted into housing for war veterans who were going to school in the city following World War II, before being converted into a rehabilitation facility for young people suffering from substance abuse issues. But it was closed in 1963 due to the cost of upkeep and the widespread corruption of the staff. In the years since, it was considered for a variety of purposes, including housing for the homeless and an extension of the jail at Rikers Island. But the danger of the unmarked man 
manholes in the advanced dilapidation of the buildings, which are mostly collapsed and overrun by poison ivy, resulted in such ideas being abandoned. It was eventually decided that the site would serve as a bird sanctuary for herons and other wading shorebirds. Although many of the original 25 buildings are still standing in some shape or form, it has been made off limits to the public and is only available for supervised visits for those intending to go ashore for quote, compelling academic and scientific purposes. With its history of confinement and death, perhaps it is best that this site has been deemed unfit for public visitation, although the history of the island is indeed compelling. Coming in at number 5 we have Mizpah Hotel. Named after the Mizpah mine, the hotel was opened in 1905. The hotel is considered a historic beacon of central Nevada's mining boom that came and went and left behind a trail of ghost towns, and is located between Las Vegas and Reno in Tonopah, Nevada, which has a population of around 2,000. Due to it being originally opened at the height of Tonopah's silver boom, it hosted celebrities and wealthy investors. The famous celebrities that have been linked to the hotel are Howard Hughes, Jack Dempsey, and Wyatt Earp. Additionally, at the time, it was the tallest building in Nevada and was one of the first luxury hotels in the state. At the time that it was built, it was heralded as a sign of Tonopah's prosperity, as it was displayed on newspaper headlines proudly displayed in the Mizpah during the area. However, over time, several accidents and crimes took place on the hotel grounds, making the hotel need to close and reopen several times, most recently in 2011 after being closed and boarded up for 10 years. The hotel is considered haunted and is known for the story of the Lady in Red. The Lady in Red was a high class adult worker who lived in the top floor of the Mizpah. She sadly lost her life at the hands of a man in the hotel by her lover. Her lover wanted her to give up her work for him, though she did not want to do that. Due to the disagreement, she sadly met her fate in the hotel. The room where paranormal activity is most active would be the room where she lost her life, and it's considered the Lady in Red's room. And it is the very room you can now book and stay in on the top floor. There have been reports from guests and staff of the Lady in Red being seen riding the elevator, while other reports of hearing her whisper in the guests and staff is. Additionally, she is known to leave pearls in the bed of guests that she is fond of. That being said, the Lady in Red is not the only spirit that haunts the hotel as there is a nameless soldier who died in the hotel and unfortunately they never were able to be identified. It has been reported that the soldier haunts the third and fourth floors. Guests have also reported of a force tugging at the back of their shirts and unexplained giggling, while others report the inability to sleep because they felt as if someone was standing next to the bed watching them all night. The Mizpah Hotel has been named the most haunted hotel in America and for a good reason. In at number 4 we have Goldfield Hotel. Located in Goldfield, Nevada, you'll find the Goldfield Hotel. The hotel opened in 1902 and formed a large crowd of visitors and guests in its early years of operation. In its early years, the Goldfield Hotel was visited by politicians, bankers, and gunslingers. Built in the heart of the town, the Goldfield Hotel was one of the most sought out buildings in Goldfield and was known as the finest hotel between San Francisco and Denver. The man behind the hotel was George Wingfield, a successful and wealthy banker, mining magnate, and joint owner of the booming Goldfield Consolidated Mines Company. However, as with many boom towns, Goldfield's mines eventually dried up, causing the population and stream of hotel guests began to dwindle. The hotel went through a series of owners, from private owners to the US Army during World War II, and now is owned by Red Robert's son. The Goldfield Hotel was once the most spectacular hotel in the state of Nevada, but today operates under a different notion as one of the most haunted places in Nevada, if not the entire United States. The most known ghost story is of a woman named Elizabeth who was speculated to be George Wingfield's mistress. Elizabeth became pregnant with Wingfield's child and to protect his marriage, George paid her to stay away, though he grew fearful that he would get exposed for cheating on his wife. Therefore, George ultimately locked her in room 109 throughout her entire pregnancy. Wingfield fed her food and water to keep her alive until the child was born, but then Elizabeth disappeared altogether and was never to be seen again. Many guests touring the Goldfield Hotel have claimed to see Elizabeth's ghost, and some even claim to hear crying, notably calling out for her child. George's ghost is also said to haunt the hotel, with guests reporting to the lingering smell of cigars and ashes being left on the floor. Those aren't the only ghosts that haunt the Goldfield Hotel, as other spirits of those who lost their lives on the grounds of Goldfield have been reported to be seen 
lurking in the halls and lobby of the old hotel. Next at number 3 is the Englewood Post Office. H. H. Holmes, no relation to Sherlock, was a deceptive figure who gained infamy in the late 19th century as one of America's first documented serial killers. Operating during the time of the 1893 World Columbian Exposition in Chicago, Holmes constructed a nightmarish building with a name I'm not even allowed to say on YouTube, but for the sake of brevity, I'll call it Death Castle. Officially named the Holmes Castle or the World's Fair Hotel, Death Castle was a three-story building located on the corner of 63rd and Wallace Street in the Englewood neighborhood of Chicago. From the outside, it looked the same as any other ordinary commercial building complete with shops and apartments. However, its true purpose was far more sinister. Inside the castle, Holmes had constructed a labyrinth of secret passages, hidden staircases, and windowless rooms designed for his nefarious deeds. He used his magnetic charm to lure and manipulate unsuspecting victims, often young women, and visitors to the World's Fair into his deadly lair. The castle featured soundproof rooms, gas chambers, trap doors, and a chilling basement equipped with dissection tables and vats of acid. Holmes would typically seduce and swindle his victims before leading them to their deaths. Many were asphyxiated with gas, mutilated, tormented both psychologically and physically, and killed in various gruesome ways. Once they were deceased, Holmes would dispose of their bodies through the building's hidden chutes, transporting them to the basement for disposal. His exact number of victims remains a mystery, but it is believed he may have killed anywhere from 20 to 200 people during his spree. His sinister acts continued undetected for years, aided by his ability to change aliens is frequently, making it difficult for authorities to track him down. Holmes' reign of terror finally came to an end when he was arrested in 1894 for an unrelated insurance fraud scheme. That castle didn't pay for itself, I guess. As investigators delved into his background, they began uncovering evidence for his horrifying crimes. On May 7, 1986, H. H. Holmes was executed. Before his death, he confessed to 27 killings, but hinted at a much higher body count. Afterwards, the infamous Death Castle was later destroyed by a mysterious fire, and a post office was built atop the ruins. Within the Englewood Post Office, it is said that you can still hear the many screams of Holmes' victims. And there have been reports of those who dared venture to the basement, which survived the fire, and you can still see Holmes killing one of his 200 victims, a phantom that echoes the terrifying events that occurred over a century ago. Brr, I just got the chills. Next up, at number two, is a short one. Resurrection Cemetery. Located in Justice, Illinois, the Resurrection Cemetery holds what it is known to be Illinois' most famous ghost, known only as Resurrection Mary. The story goes that Mary was a vibrant and lively dancer who attended the dance hall in the 1930s. One fateful night, she left the hall after an argument with her partner and decided to walk home alone along Archer Avenue. Tragically, Mary was struck and killed by a hit and run driver while walking along the desolate road. Since then, motorists driving along the street will often see Mary's ghost walking along the road wearing a white gown and dancing shoes. In some cases, Mary will appear as a hitchhiker, but by the time the car reaches Resurrection Cemetery, she would suddenly vanish, occasionally taking the driver with her. Remember guys, don't pick up mysterious, ghostly women off the side of the road. It's called Stranger Danger, and we should all know it by now. Moving on to number one is Manteno State Mental Hospital. Established in Manteno, Illinois in 1930, the Manteno State Mental Hospital initially served as a psychiatric facility for mentally ill and developmentally disabled patients, offering them treatment and care. However, over the years, the hospital's conditions deteriorated, leading to allegations of beatings, neglect, and the mistreatment of its vulnerable inhabitants. These inhumane conditions only worsened as time passed, with tales of neglect, experimentation, and even deaths due to inadequate medical attention began to spread, shrouding the institution and its reputation in darkness and sorrow. The hospital was at its worst when 384 patients and staff came down with typhoid fever in 1939 in an incident referred to as the Manteno Madness. The the director of the hospital mistook the affliction to be nothing more than a case of diarrhea, but when patients and staff began dying, panic set in. Patients banging on windows, orderlies going missing, doctors deliberately injuring their patients. Everything that could go wrong, went wrong. Those who died during the Manteno madness would later haunt the abandoned asylum after its closure in 1985. Those who visited the old hospital would report seeing patients and doctors alike scurrying about the abandoned halls, but it was those who ventured into the tunnels beneath the hospital that were in real danger. Paranormal investigators have gone down into the tunnels in hopes of finding the rumored ghosts, but are met with a much more sinister presence. It is said that the malevolent doctors who would mistreat their patients wander the complex of tunnels, hoping to release their rage upon anyone stupid enough to enter their domain. What was once a place that healed was now a place that harmed, enthralling thrill seekers to see the mad doctors for themselves, only to pay an unfortunate price. After the repeated disappearances of ghost hunters, urban explorers, vandals and the like, the building 
building was demolished by Wrecking Ball in 2015 to discourage anyone from entering the haunted ground. <laughs>